morning. 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 So, Judy, you haven't entered in what your um, title is. Are we, are we saying that you are leader of the uh, Labour group? Yeah, I, I don't know how to do that, I'm afraid, on, on my system. No, OK, that's fine. It's just that I'm going to introduce people, so... Morning, Paul. Morning, everyone. Morning. Sorry. Morning. Hi, Judy. Morning, Owen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Horrible noises. Is everybody else? Yes, don't worry. It's when we start, well, all the microphones will be off, so um, except for the people speaking, so that should take away all that sound. Okay. Sharon told me last night that shirt and tie were required, but I'm afraid I couldn't find shirt and tie. Hope that's okay. Yeah, all, all the ladies equivalent. That's fine, Judy, don't worry. And just to remind everybody, I've asked officers not only to be on mute, as we all should be uh, when we're not speaking, but officers will also have their cameras off unless they're brought into the meeting. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Owen. Yeah. Morning, Steve. Better than the uh, full council at North Park yesterday. It was a bit laborious, wasn't it? 
can you anyone see me? Because I can't see me on my screen. On my screen, it's Stephen. It's... Um, no, Stephen, we can't see you. Can't see you. Oh, no, I can't see you either. Thankfully. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Right, what have I done wrong? Good morning. Stephen, I think Is if you put here? your camera in landscape mode and tap it, the camera logo comes okay. up. I've got the I've got the Oh, no. 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 Stephen, unlike other systems, you've got to uh, tap the screen to bring up the submenu, then tap the video camera icon. That brings up a secondary uh, menu screen where you tap the video icon again to, to bring up your video. I can't see Ralph. I can't see Tim. I can't see Annie. I can't see Bob and I can't see Stephen. Terry, it's Bob here. Um, I can see most of those other people, but I cannot see you. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Terry, same here. Can't I can see, see you. Yes, Terry's gone blank. The camera icon on my uh, iPad has a small white person in the top left corner, which wasn't there yesterday. So has it been muted somewhere at one end to restrict the number of people? Ah. I can see myself, but I'm not sure why you can't see me. Ralph, I can see you. I can see everybody else apart from Terry. Hi, Oh. Mine's gone completely now. Oh, for goodness sake. We can hear you, Stephen, so careful. I don't swear, Jude, it's okay. Oh, it's all right. I do. <laughs> Warning to myself. I've lost absolutely everything now trying to press that icon. You may have pressed stop video. Uh, in the secondary menu, There's a there are three icons across the top. And the video no, feed no, has no, a no, little no, right no, person no, icon no, when it's not showing. So you tap no, I've that. Got any of those icons, unlike yesterday, it's brought up the icons on my iPad for some reason. Oh, for goodness. I'm going to have to look back in. Oh, no, it's come back. Okay. Now I can see myself, but with the camera blocked off at the bottom. Can you see me? No, no matter. I can just speak. Can you hear me? Can you see us, Stephen? Yes, I can see you. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can all hear you. It's just not bringing these icons up. I've got, I've got the chat anyway. 
Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you all see me now? Can you? No. No, no I can't be seen. No. no. Oh. That's going to be interesting, isn't it? Hi, I'm just going to have a quick check. check. Oh, you're back, Terry, bottom right hand corner. I'm just checking, is the volume okay? Yeah, Okay. Okay. Right. I think we're all here. Can, right. I start the meeting. I'm not sure if you can see me or not, but um, no, Terry. We'll we start. can either see you. We can either see you or hear you. Can't do both. It's something your end. Yeah, yesterday we fiddled with. Hang on a minute. I think Judy can see me now. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't speak. <laughs> I can't unmute myself. No, that's because I've got no, control. No, we can hear you. We can hear you, Judy. Okay. Thank the Lord for that, eh? Terry, we can't hear you, so I suggest you go as you are. Yeah, I, I don't know what's gone wrong. Anyway, good morning, everybody. And to members of the public that may be listening to this broadcast, I'm very sorry about the technical problems. Um, it w worked well in the um, rehearsal, as it were. Um, I don't know if anybody, if the uh, audience, if the public can see me. I'm not quite sure, sure members can, but I think they can hear me. I'm hoping they can. Um, so welcome to this special cabinet panel, um, which is this is the first electronic meeting of the council, um, and hopefully that it goes well. Um, I have um, a notice to read at first. So I'm uh, County Councillor Theresa Heritage. I'm Deputy Leader of the Council and I'm chairing the meeting today. Um, so I have a notice to read. Following the government announcement that the UK has now moved into the delay phase of the response to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically in accordance with the local authorities and police and crime panels coronavirus, fle flexibility of local authority and police and crime panels meetings, England and Wales regulations, 2020. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the council's website for them to do so. Members of the special cabinet panel are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak, 
and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speak, speaking. To indicate a wish to speak, members should please either raise their hand so that I can see it or request to speak using the chat function. I will ask mem I, when we come into voting, I will ask members to vote for, against or abstain for each item at the end of the debate on that item and ask that members indicate their vote using the public chat function, if they can. Um, if not, hold your hand up so I can see it. I will declare the result after each vote. Officers are in attendance, but will keep their cameras and microphones switched off unless called to speak. Now, hopefully everybody heard that. Um, at the meeting today, we have, um, I'm going to name who I hope we have in attendance. So we have uh, Judy Billing as leader of the De uh, Labour Party group. Fiona Hill, Deputy um, Executive Member for Public Health. Paul Zukowski, Lib Dem, Dem, um, Lib Dem Deputy Leader. Um, let's see who else we got. We've got Bob Deering, Deputy Member for Resources. Steve Jarvis, a member of the Lib Dem Group. Tim Hutchins, Cabinet Member for Public Health. Ralph Sangster, Cabinet Member for Resources, um, and Richard Roberts, uh, Executive Member for Adult Care, and Annie Brewster, Deputy Executive Member for Adult Care, and Sharon Taylor, a lab Labour Group Member. So we'll now move on to... Um, so we have no apologies because everybody's here, which is wonderful. So we'll now move on to item one, um, the special cabinet panel terms of reference. And could I ask Quentin Baker, please, our chief legal officer, to give a brief uh, report? Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, uh, report is... Uh, you will have seen the, the relatively short report um, in the agenda pack. Um, the purpose of this report really is uh, it's in line with the, the um, uh, special measures being taken, the special arrangements put in place um, at HCC to continue uh, to ensure that the activities, the operations of the council and the decision making processes and so on can proceed in the circumstances where we're using virtual meetings such as this. Um, and one of the uh, actions agreed with group leaders was to um, reduce, reduce the number of um, cabinet uh, panels and to focus the activity of the cabinet panels into uh, this particular uh, panel, the special cabinet panel, um, and the terms of reference for which are set out at uh, paragraph four. Um, I hope that's a sufficient introduction. I'm more than happy to take any specific questions. Procedure is for uh, fielding questions. Yes, we may have lost Can Terry everyone hear me? Yes, so I suggest that uh, if Terry doesn't come back in, uh, Ralph, is it uh, appropriate for you to uh, uh, to hold the ring? Paul, you had. Uh... Hear me? Uh, yes. yes. We can hear you yes. now. Can you hear me? Fine, thank you. 
Uh, well, whilst Terry gets up her, uh, her herself back into the meeting, I'll just uh, proceed. Uh, I think uh, you indicated yesterday that you had a couple of questions regarding the uh, the terms of reference. Uh, yeah. Okay. The uh, the, the issue um, is at one at one level uh, very simple and easy to fix, but at another level pretty critical, and that is that the recommendation, as written in the PER, refers to um, the terms of reference being set out in paragraph five of the report. In fact, when you look at the next paragraph, which is uh, section four, that is where the terms of reference are. Section five is, in fact, the financial implications of which there is stated to be none. So the recommendation as written in the paper is not correct. And, and actually, there is a numbering issue in section four as well. Um, so I think the paper needs some significant attention. There are other issues with it. For example, paragraph 2.3 appears to refer to regulations coming in force in two sections uh, which are not grammatically reconcilable. Um, so I think the uh, paper needs a little bit of attention, but most specifically, the recommendation needs to be accurate and correct in what section it's actually referring to. Tim, could you answer those, please? So, uh, taking the first one, first point about the recommendations, that, that, that was a typo in the report, and the report that's on the, on the website has been updated. It was updated yesterday, and um, so it is showing the correct uh, details and, and the numbering, which had gone awry, awry in the formatting of the document, has been corrected as well. So, the recommendation as it stands um, is uh, now correct, and thank you for pointing that out, Paul. Um, the other aspect, I'm just looking now at paragraph 2.3, um, regulations for kind of, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm clear on the issue with that one, Paul. Would you, would you mind just restating your concern on paragraph 2.3? Uh, yeah, sure. The, um, <clears throat> so the paragraph uh, basically says that uh, emerges legislation uh, pass provides regulations, and those are due to come into force on the 4th of April 2020. Um, but it then says um, live webcast and live stream, live interacting streaming, full stop, which are currently being drafted, are expected to be published in early April 2020. So it says 4th of April is when the regulations come in, but they're being drafted and are expected to be published in April 2020. It's just a bit of a, a disjoint, and I, I think it's just a hangover. Um, in fact, if the, if the section stopped at the word live interactive streaming, it would probably be fine. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It's, uh, I think events probably have developed whilst this report was being drafted, and hence why there's a, another typo in there. So uh, apologies for that, and uh, I think you're right. Hopefully, uh, if members would accept that uh, the uh, ending of the sentence live interactive streaming and to, and to remove the other. Okay, so I think I'm back in the meeting. Great. Apologies for that. I, 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 shall, I, shall I just finish this item? Yes, please, Ralph. Okay. Um, all, all right. Uh, has anybody else got any questions regarding the terms of reference? I'm assuming everybody's okay unless they're coming back to me. Oh, sorry. Stephen. Yes. Steve, Stephen, go ahead. I, I did comment earlier. I said I wanted to speak earlier, but anyway, I, I'm trying to use the, pub, the, ch the chat. Is that what you want us to do? But it seemed you know, not everyone's reading it. I was expecting to do this. Okay. Um, no. Apologies. Right. Firstly, Stephen Giles Meadows, leader of the Liberal Democrat group, who wasn't mentioned at the beginning of the proceedings. So I'm on on the, the panel as well. Right. I understand, Therese. Don't worry. Don't don't need to apologise. Uh, no issues generally with the terms of reference. 
except that in the agreed protocol with the leaders, with Judy, David and myself, we agreed to review the protocol at each monthly leaders meeting rather than necessarily carrying this forward for three months. So I just need that reflected in my view in this. And not saying it won't carry on for two to three months, but we did agree in the protocol, and I've checked the protocol, um, that the, the processes uh, for special cabinet panel and cancelling the normal cabinet panels would be reviewed at the monthly leaders meetings. And I'd like that reflected in the decision. Quintin, can you confirm that you've, uh, you've captured all of those uh, issues and that they can be incorporated into the, uh, the report and the recommendations? Yeah, absolutely. Is, uh, with those proposals being uh, amended, can I uh, say that we've, uh, we are in agreement with the, uh, with the amended proposal? Thumbs up if you're okay. All right, it seems that everybody's okay with that. Uh, Terry, no, Terry. Uh, I think no, that, was, that, was, that was carried and uh, I'll hand it, the meeting back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Ralph. I'm apologies about that. I'm not quite sure. Technology, anyway. Um, so, I'm assuming again you can hear me and see me, but let me know if not. I'll see you. Um, so now I'm. Pardon? I can't see you. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, I can Good. hear you. Okay, but I can't. Just, just to say, okay. I can't make the camera work on this today. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, yes, Sharon, we can hear you. Can't make the camera work. Yes, we today. can. I don't know why. No, I've got that problem too, Sharon. So um, you can hear me, so we'll carry on. And so, Sharon, we'll listen out for you as well. So just shout if you want to say something. Um, so we're now moving on to item two, um, which is Hertfordshire HCC's response to COVID 19. Um, and can members please note that this report is, ac as, is accurate as at the 7th and 8th of um, uh, April. And could I ask Owen Mapley, Chief Executive, please, to uh, give a report? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, as, as you say, this, uh, this paper is an attempt to provide a comprehensive overview of the work that's underway uh, across the Council. Uh, as you see from the media and the daily reports that we're sending out, uh, it's a rapidly evolving position. Uh, so it's inevitable that there'll be some things in this paper uh, where things will have moved on since it, it was written. I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail because the paper itself is detailed, but simply by way of introduction, I'd like to pay a public tribute uh, to a, the large numbers of uh, council staff and others um, who have been working intensely over the last few weeks uh, to continue our services and to ramp up our services. So uh, particularly those in uh, frontline roles who are working uh, in many cases right alongside uh, NHS, uh, workers, uh, particularly those in care settings, both adult care and children's care. Uh, the education yeah. teams have had a hugely uh, intense time working very closely with our schools uh, and school head teachers and teachers have done a remarkable job um, to prepare for and then operate uh, whilst uh, whilst they have been closed apart from for, uh, for those who are, are still uh, eligible to go to school. Um, not directly employed by the council, but there are over 30,000 uh, people in the care workforce across Hertfordshire who are very much uh, on the front line of uh, service provision. Uh, and so many of us were delighted to see the clap for carers um, very explicitly extended beyond the remarkable work going on in the NHS uh, to those providing social care across the county. Um, and there's a lot of people behind the scenes uh, who are working to keep the council going in technology and HR and finance and so on. Um, and then finally, I uh, want to pay tribute to uh, the councillors um, who are working not just from the county council, but from the, the district council and district council staff as well, and the large numbers of volunteers uh, who have signed up to help us uh, protect vulnerable people, supply food, uh, supply medicines, uh, etc. So it's inevitable that I will miss people out, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, but I do want to pay a very sincere uh, tribute to all those I've mentioned and anybody else uh, who's working hard um, to, uh, to respond to, to the crisis. But uh, I'll pause there by way of introduction. Um, thank you, Owen. Um, can I, is any member wish to, um, I'm sure you do, wish to ask some questions, if you could let me know? 
Oh, so Stephen um, hasn't got a uh, voice at the moment, so he's echoing um, Owen's uh, sentiments. Um, Richard Roberts, please. So can I'm you hear you, Richard? Hear me. If I just... Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. I, I suppose being responsible for adult social care at this time has proved, well, has allowed me to see just what an effort that can be made when we're called upon to work with our partners right across Hertfordshire. The effort that has been made with the NHS, with our social care, across the voluntary sector, the districts and the private sector, to make sure that the NHS does not fall over and that that has not happened in Hertfordshire and that we have played a huge contribution in that is both heartwarming and I think bodes well for the future. Both Watford and Lister hospitals are coping and in part they are coping and I'll take this one one step slightly further uh, than, than Owen mentioned. I'm going to mention two people, Andy Malibu and Heidi Hall, who have been part of the discharge teams and have led the uh, discharge of patients from the hospital, allowing them to have the capacity to be able to deal with COVID. And as a result, the those hospitals have coped from start and are coping at the moment as we reach peak. And that is, that is a great credit to both social care working hand in glove with NHS colleagues. And that cooperation is something we should celebrate now in this meeting and it's something we can celebrate in the future and build on, I think. Uh, I'd, also, I'd also like uh, uh, at this juncture to um, uh, thank all of our staff uh, particularly within adult social care for um, prepare, helping to prepare not just with the NHS uh, but across our care services, our care homes, um, working with our support services across learning disability uh, and, and of course extra care where the preparations both financial and making sure we got the beds and making sure that care homes are able to cope and that we have the spare beds as people come out of hospital, all of that has meant that Hertfordshire is in a position to cope with what is a horrendous uh, a, a crisis that we, that we have, uh, are having to deal with. Um, you will have seen the figures. There are a number uh, that is in the region of about 160 who have died in care homes. I would just like to pass on, before handing back to you, uh, Theresa, I would just like to pass on my heartfelt thanks to all of our home care and our learning disability support care and our extra care staff who have worked at the front line to both look after people in their dying moments, but also before they go to hospital and when they come back again. That level of work is so commendable uh, and I, I, I believe genuinely that the public now, when they clap at eight o'clock, they are clapping for that care as much as they are for, for NHS. And so with that, I would like to hand back, but to say uh, with, with the effort that we have made, it has made a huge difference in how we are coping in the county. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker that's indicated, they actually come up here on, as guest, and I'm wondering if that's you, Sharon. Yes, um, I, I did ask to speak, Teresa. Thank you. Um, that must be all, you. Okay, thanks. Can you, can you hear me? You can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't work out how to put your name into the thing, so I have to do a bit more practice on this uh, system. So, um, okay. first of all, uh, I wanted to say... Um, a little bit about the, the partnership working that's gone on. Um, we've, um, first of all, uh, a big um, pat on the back to Daryl Keane, who's led the local resilience forum, uh, who has um, really been working very hard to pull all this together um, with the district councils and the county council um, and public health and bringing in all of our other partners as well. I think uh, from a personal point of view, I think this has gone a very long way to uh, raise um, the, uh, the the profile of local government, not just um, in the minds of the people uh, in our communities, but also 
um, with government. I don't, do you know what? The strange thing is, I, I sometimes think government didn't really have much of a clue about what we do in local government. Uh, and it certainly highlighted um, what we can do. And I think the partnership working across the board, um, across uh, districts and counties, with other partners, and across the party political boundaries uh, has been uh, really superb. We've all had the best interests of our communities at heart. Of course, there have been some issues arising along the way, um, but we've, we're resolving them uh, by working together. And um, I think this, I hope that this will go a very long way in the future um, to uh, a, a greater degree of trust in what local government can do. I did want to mention a couple of issues. One is um, we still have ongoing resources issues. I'm sure we're going to discuss them in more detail later on. Um, and uh, very concerned about the, um, the, you know, the, the government's uh, clear pledges to us that if we did what was necessary, we would be funded to do it. Now, some funding has been forthcoming. It wouldn't be fair not to say that. But um, we are very concerned now that they may be rowing back a bit on their pledge to support what we're doing with the appropriate funding to do it. Secondly, the um, absolute um, uh, bonus it's been that public health is um, in local hands at the moment. I think that's been, we are lucky in Hertfordshire to have a fantastic director of public health, but the fact that we, um, we have um, public health uh, at local level um, has been a great boon. And I think if anybody ever suggests changing that, we should really resist that uh, very, uh, very hard. Um, the, there has been a, a huge and uh, unprecedented impact. Actually, I get told off for saying unprecedented. I'll probably get a, a black mark against my name for that on our communities. There's no doubt about that, particularly the most vulnerable people in our communities. And that is um, yet to, um, we're yet to see the full impact of that, I'm sure. Um, so particular concerns around uh, some of our young people who are finding the whole lockdown thing, uh, that th these are the ones in teenage years, exams that they thought they were going to be sitting, they're not sitting, they're not able to see their friends, their relationships are suffering. I know they, they're better on the technology than I am, that's for sure, but uh, it's tough for them. And also the older and, and more vulnerable members of our community. There have been some hiccups with shielding. I'm not going um, uh, to gloss over those. There have been some real hiccups with that. And I think if anything was learned from that, it's please, government, talk to us before you make announcements and we'll help with that. Um, and lastly, on the economy, um, we've all been working really hard together to um, try and uh, address the economic issues. But there is a long, long slope back to recovery <laughs> on that front. But um, I, you know, my personal view is that um, we have seen our staff, both at county and district level, absolutely pull out all the stops and um, you know, the credibility and the respect with which they're held now by the public has gone up um, fantastically through this whole issue. So my thank you to them um, and uh, thanks to um, all of those who are really helping to support our communities in these very difficult times. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you. I, I quite agree with your sentiments around the partnership working. It's been a, a really good example how local government, all tiers and all partners can work together on the ground. Um, there was a sort of a question around funding. Um, <laughs> do you want, can we cover that later on in the next item, yes. Sharon? Is that okay? Yep. Yeah, is that absolutely. all right? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, I didn't particularly hear any other um, questions that I need to bring officers in on. So if you're okay with that then, Sharon, I'll move on to the next person who is indicated, and that's Bob Deering. And then I have Stephen Giles my yeah. Thank you, Terry. Um, so at risk of repetition. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can, can you hear, hear me, you. Yeah. Um, I, yes. Just at risk of repetition, I, I, I just want to add my acknowledgement of the fantastic work done, so far as I can see, by every member of Hertfordshire County Council um, at all sorts of levels. Um, and if I could just pick out a couple of things, I think I'm right to say that we rolled out Microsoft Teams to about 8,000 people in about a week. And that strikes me as phenomenal. 
Um, and, and I also uh, am, I know that the uh, call centre has obviously uh, uh, been used a lot by residents, um, and the performance of the call centre has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, and these are things that might not seem like real frontline issues, but it all goes to show that every member of Hertfordshire County Council, member and officer alike, has really done what they've had to do. I just think it's fantastic, and I think it must be very important to acknowledge it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, could I have now, please, um, Stephen Giles Medhurst? Uh, thank you, Theresa. Yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, the very profound comments that Owen has made, indeed other members, I'm not going to repeat it all. Uh, I think Owen has en encapsulated probably all what we think in terms of the public service that's being delivered uh, from very junior employees to very senior management, not only at Hertfordshire, uh, but obviously in the 10 district as well. Uh, and I hope like the rest of us, uh, if, if we're not actually isolated in home and able to go out for our hours or so exercise and we see any of our employees out uh, at a social distance, we do thank them for carrying on the work. I've certainly been doing that where I've seen road sweepers out, where I've seen ringway out, where I've seen the police. Uh, I think it's important we show our gratitude uh, to everyone who's carrying on in what is very difficult circumstances. In terms of report, Theresa, I don't know how you want to manage this, because I've got probably half a dozen questions, but rather than jumping around the report all over the report yeah. like other members might, I didn't know if you want to just go through it in section by section from the Hertfordshire position. Yes. I mean, the government position we obviously know. Uh, so, for instance, you know, I've got questions on, on paragraph five, and then I've got various questions on various sections in six and so on. So really, it was a question asking you how you want to handle this. Otherwise, I could see us going up backwards and forwards on the same point from different members. Um, and I know it's, yeah. it's easier when you're face to face to do it, but obviously we've got to cope with the circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know. So what I was going to say to you, Stephen, was if that you could take each section um, that you wanted to ask a question on, and then I can call the relevant officer to respond if necessary. Um, and then um, if there is a member who wants to ask a question in that section, so if you can say rather than just paragraph five or six, actually say what it's about, because yeah. um, I'm not quite sure how it, who's got what in front of them. Um, we, we can cover it that way rather than, as you say, toing and froing. That would be great. Okay. So thank if you, you could start with the first topic. Thank, thank you, Theresa. It's the Hertfordshire position, Operation Shield uh, and Operation Sustain, which are paragraph okay. 5.3. Um, and 5.36 refers to the number of people from the government uh, on the website of 8,450, of which 3,245 indicated the need for help and have been contacted. It's really what's happening with uh, the difference between the 8,000 and the 3,000 and whether any contacts being made with those. And similarly, 5.34, it refers to over 15,000 people receiving the letter saying they're in high risk and should be isolated. Are we making any efforts and who or we, in terms of the we, it means collectively, not just us, the districts and NHS uh, contacting those people. Uh, and on Operation Sustain, which is 5.4, it's all the same paragraph. Um, it's the, the Team Hearts volunteering uh, issue. Um, I and indeed some of my colleagues have volunteered four weeks ago. All we've had so far are some webcam uh, introductions and, and now I've volunteered elsewhere uh, to do some work. Um, I know there's a lot of volunteers, how are we coping with getting them in because I'm getting rumbling from people, well I volunteered four weeks ago, no one's contacted me, what was the point? Uh, comments coming back, residents who have emailed or indeed rung me. Uh, so if that could be covered, thank you. Okay, so could I ask Ian McBeath, please, the Director of um, Adult Care and Health, to respond? Yeah, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Stephen, on, on your first point, um, you, you're right. So we've got a cohort of people who received the letter, initial letter from the government saying you're shielded with the group. Um, please get in contact with us so that we know whether you're coping or not. Um, a relatively small proportion of people got 
got back in contact with the government's call centre, we've now been sent the list of everyone who's contacted them and who's not, and we will be making contact with all of those people, either by phone, through Hearts Help, in person or through the voluntary sector. And we're cross-referencing with all of our other records locally to see if other people are indeed in contact with agencies already, um, so that it, it reduces that job somewhat. Um, ju just to add to that, uh, about another 8,000 people have been added to the shielded list just over the last week because GPs have been asked to look at the list as it stands um, and make sure that all the people that expect to be on there are on there. So we've actually got another group of people we need to deal with now. Um, and the trick is going to be using the volunteers that we've got to try and get in contact with those people within safe bounds of sort of data protection and so on. Um, on, on, the, on your second point, uh, you're right, we've had about 8,000 volunteers now for Operation Sustain. And actually, the NHS's volunteering scheme uh, went out at a similar time, and they've passed some of their volunteer numbers to us too. Um, we've deployed just over 2,500 of them through Team Hearts, through our organisations. But there are about 5,500 people that we're, we're yet to use. So we're trying to keep in contact with them. We think this job is going to grow. And as we get in contact with more and more people, they may need food parcels or shopping or prescriptions or dog walking. They might just need company. Um, and so we're trying to get the vol sector to come up with schemes to reduce loneliness as well as do those very practical things. And that's when I think we'll see the numbers of volunteers ramping up. So um, we're going to try and write to people more often and sort of keep um, and hopefully we'll retain as many as we can as the, as the task grows. Okay, uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, Judy, you wanted to make a comment here as, as a partly shielded person. I know what you mean. No, partly, <coughs> excuse me, partly as a shielded person, um, because I have the not unique but quite interesting experience at the moment of being both heavily involved as a local councillor, both at districts and county, but also a recipient of the shielding um, things that are happening. And I also wanted to add my overwhelming gratitude to everybody for the partnership working, um, for the work that's going on in districts as well as the county. Um, and one of those occasions, I think, where the criticism of many of us being twin hatters um, needs to uh, be put on the back burner because actually I think it's been quite useful. So that, for instance, I have a weekly meeting in my district hat with the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner um, and the Deputy Chief Constable about some of the terrible vulnerabilities that are at risk of, of, of disappearing in all this so that we know that um, um, domestic abuse cases are rising but we're having fewer reports of safeguarding issues because fewer um, visits are being made by services to people's actual houses. So some of those things are really important. I just wanted to give a couple of moments of experience, though, that maybe we learn for the future. I don't know. I was sent a food parcel yesterday, and I've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that it's redirected to those who really need it, because I didn't ask for it under my shielding responses to county, um, but I think something I said was clearly misread. Um, and, I, I, and this box is burning a hole in my hallway because I feel so guilty to have received it. But the other bit of learning, apart from possibly moments of overzeal, um, has been the, um, and it's the NHS crossover with public health that I have to mention, because it's been some of the phone calls from GPs and letters to people in my situation, putting what I regard as a quite upsetting level of pressure on me to um, fill in documents agreeing to do not resuscitate in the event of my becoming ill. Now, a well-supported, member of many communities and a large and supportive family. And I have found that very upsetting. Heaven knows what that will be doing to um, frail, elderly, isolated people 
if they get such a call from a GP and get the forms, which I could show you, to fill in that I've been asked to do. I was asked by my GP if I had made a will, um, if I knew what um, resuscitation was like in terms of breaking people's ribs. Um, I was asked if I had um, those uh, agreements that you have with your family about when they take over the name of which I've temporarily forgotten. What okay, thank, thank you. So, so I, there are just some bits of learning that all of us in our different communities as county councillors need to be aware of, as well as the shining examples of working together, which I do not deny for one second. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Judy. Yes, um, that's a piece of work that we're going to have to start pretty soon about collecting our, our different experiences. Um, can I ask Ian to come back and just respond to uh, Judy's comments then, and I'll come back to you, Stephen. Yeah, I'll keep it very brief. I, I do recognise what Judy said, and we, we did have some um, serious concerns with some of our care providers who were contacted by people from the NHS who were really following the letter of some guidance quite stringently and probably a little bit overzealously. Um, the NHS, our CCGs, responded so positively, we've come up with a joint statement together for all of our care providers about what that guidance really means. That's been sent out to every GP practice in Hertfordshire and every practice manager, and I'll make sure the link to that document goes in the minutes of this meeting. Okay. Th thank you, Ian. Um, Stephen, can you want to ask your next question? Uh, if, if we're finished on, on, on that, yes. Because uh, my next one was going to be adult care services. I don't know if anyone else had any more questions. On shield or sustain. Does anybody have anything on shield or sustain? Annie, is yours on uh, shield or I've sustain? Got, got, mine's on uh, shielding and sustain, uh, Terry. If that's okay. Um, we okay, Sharon. learned we learned yesterday that another eight thousand um, letters are going out in Hertfordshire to those who are being shielded. Um, I would be interested to know, um, we, is it possible to get at district level the number of those who are on the shielded list who have been contacted or not contacted? Um, we have been calling, um, I, I know uh, county officers have as well, uh, those who have not um, responded to the shielding letter. Um, but um, I'm still concerned that some people who are being, who are on the shielding list, it's the exact opposite experience to Judy, actually. People who do need some help but are worried to ask for it. Um, uh, I'm still concerned that we're not reaching uh, those that we need to. And I don't actually know how many of the listed shielded residents we've got to in my district. So um, it would be useful if those figures are available, if we could have an update reasonably regularly uh, on that. We've also... Um, when the, some of the uh, food arrived for the sustain um, for the sustain group, because we we've got a community response hub in Stevenage, um, and I know experiences in other parts of the country have been even worse than this, but um, we found that some of the catering pack sizes of things were just not appropriate. We're, we're trying to deal mostly with the single, uh, elderly, vulnerable. Um, Sing, a lot of single people, because um, that's the nature of, of shielding often, and sometimes couples. We're not dealing with people for whom a five kilo bag of pasta is going to be a right lot of good, to be honest. So um, I think there is still some work. That's when I referred to some hiccups in the processes. I think um, offering um, uh, this, this uh, role to food wholesalers, who by their very nature produce massive quantity size packs of things, um, has not been the best decision. I, I, you know, it's not a county decision, it's a government decision, but I, I'm really uh, concerned that um, if that carries on, uh, the food packs themselves were, um, if you did need it, were fairly um, meagre, to say the least, and we've had to supplement ours. Um, and then uh, the, the size of the packages. I'm also really, really concerned, and one of my counsellors raised this with me because she's a diabetic and she has elderly parents with uh, very serious health needs themselves, that 
there is no um, no account taken of dietary requirements at the moment. You could put people at serious risk here if you don't take account of their dietary requirements. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Ian, do you want to come back on that? Just briefly, Sharon, I'll, I'll, um, I'm, I'm certain we can provide the list of 8,000 people by district. So I'll look into that and, uh, to, with Helen Manaf and see what the best way is to get that information out to, to district councils. Um, because I know they're doing brilliant work with, uh, and, and, po and possibly the lion's share in that, doing that phoning around. Um, I think in terms of the, the food, you're right. The, the stuff that initially arrived, um, what was from wholesalers that the government had ordered and wasn't suitable, you know, almost cans of beans and that sort of thing. Um, and we've changed that now. So the packs that are coming now are better. Um, and they are dealing now with both culturally sensitive and dietary requirements. I will just check the diabetic thing. I can't believe they haven't thought of that. And I know that Hills, Hearts Independent Living Services have been helping us with the nutritional balance of some of those packs as well. For example, there's very little protein um, in, the, in the packs to start with. It was all carbohydrate. Um, and, and Hills have been helping us to uh, get a be better balance in those packs. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ian. I mean, I've, I've had experience of that as well. I think we all have some of the comments coming up on chat that we, we've all experienced the problems with the food parcels and what's contained in them. But, um, and obviously each community is um, operating in a different way because there's also local community help going on. But it's good that we're all covering each other. Um, so, um, Annie, you indicated you wanted to speak. Is it actually on um, this particular subject? No, okay. I'm assuming that I am being heard. Yeah. Can you hear me now, Terry? Uh, yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Lovely. Um, yes, I'm not sure if it's one for Ian um, and maybe Owen as well. It's a two prong no. one. Annie, um, have you got a, Annie, Annie, have you got a yeah. question on shield or sustain? If not, we're just doing yes. shield and sustain questions. Okay, yeah. right. Just ask the yeah. question then. Okay, the question is, um, the chain of um, Hearts Help then to district groups and then to parish groups seems to be working quite well. Going back to the question of the number of volunteers, um, it's a question that, uh, as a letter go only going out to the 8,000 uh, SHIELD people to offer help, or is a letter going to go out to everybody? Because I'm concerned about the groups slightly below the SHIELD ones. Um, at, at a very local level, we've managed to do it by sending out leaflets, um, it, 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 saying the sort of things we can help with. But I wonder if that's getting through to um, everyone uh, throughout the county, if other members have managed that. And the other thing is, um, I just really understand if ongoing, um, if the sustain support can actually help food banks as well, or if that's something that we should be really encouraging donations to food banks still. Okay, thank you. Ian? It, it's Owen here, uh, just to uh, oh, uh, add, add, a couple, uh, add a couple of comments, and Ian can come in uh, to correct anything I've missed. Uh, that we are very conscious of the need to uh, be available to anybody who needs help. Uh, clearly, that those in the specific shield list um, who had been most exposed to the most damaging implications of, of COVID um, are the highest priority, but there are others who need support. And so a lot of our social media and media coverage has been trying to advertise the uh, sources uh, for people or the routes for people to indicate they need help, uh, and we'll follow all of those up. Uh, we're also in the process of distributing a leaflet to every single household in Hertfordshire, which will happen over the course of the next week or two, um, that recognises that by the time that leaflet arrives, some people may have been um, isolating for a, for a period of time. Uh, so even if it wasn't acute originally, it may have become so. Uh, so uh, we will continue to put out lots of comms and media about where people can go to help. Uh, and uh, we'll, be work we'll continue to work with that full supply chain that you talked about 
um, of voluntary organisations, district councils, um, uh, invaluable providers like Hills uh, to continue to do all that we can. And anything that was um, surplus, for want of a better word, from the original uh, supplies that we were given by the government, uh, we have also been sending supplies to food banks. Um, so uh, we're doing as, as much as we can on, on all of those points. Okay, thanks. Ian, do you want to come back with anything? I, I, I think Owen just mentioned we, we are supplying food to food banks as well. Um, so through through yeah. this mechanism, we're, we're doing both parcels and food banks. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much. Um, so I've got um, on this particular subject matter, I have um, Richard, then Stephen, and then Sharon, and then I think we'll we'll shut, sustain, and shield down if we may. So Richard. I, I very Richard, briefly can you... will. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm looking for a yes. nod. You can hear. Me. There we are. Yeah. So I, I, my my comment is really to echo the thanks uh, to Helen Minerf and her team, who from a starting stand uh, and using Mundles managed to build on the on the food that was sent from government trying to unpick the various data lists that were coming through and then making sure that the food parcels that went out were enhanced with both fresh food as well as the dry goods and that those went out to the people that really needed it because they were relatively few within that initial 15,000 people in Hertfordshire who were contacted and whilst there are some who have not come forward we are we are reasonably certain because of the the com co constant following up with people and and that partnership work that you've all commended that we're reasonably certain that all those that need uh, our food parcels and uh, their medicines delivered that is happening. So um, I, I I commend those that have been working out of Mundles, uh, but equally I think as Ian mentioned we are sending food to food banks. We're sending food to the district councils. I think five have signed up, and to charities as well. Uh, and it and it is a um, it is an ongoing developing situation where anybody, whether they are shielded, whether they're in the first tranche of letters, the second tranche of letters, whether they're in the sustain, whether they are simply individuals ringing up, we are working through those to make sure they get what they want. And there is such good community work going on at the moment. It is just commendable. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. Stephen. Uh, uh, th thank you, Theresa. Uh, I accept totally the very difficult job that's been undertaken here with Mundles and, and all the staff and having to get up to speed, and it is very, very difficult. I just want to double check that when we're sending stuff out in, fu uh, in future, not necessarily in food, but we are checking not just the dietary requirements, but other things such as uh, lacto intolerance dairy-free celiac, because I've certainly had some people get in touch with me that they, they were certainly less so a problem now, but three weeks ago, all those type of products had disappeared from the shop cell because people were buying them because they couldn't get their normal products. And these particular families were, were struggling to find actually food they could even eat, let alone uh, food generally. So I'm just checking that when we're asking people what their dietary requirements are, we're covering their allergy issues as well. Otherwise, as Sharon's already said, we'll end up with other problems. Um, and I would echo, at, certainly in Watford, the food banks, and there's been self-set up food banks like in Oxy Village, they've set up their own food bank just for the village. Um, and it's working very, very well. Uh, and they appreciate the work the county's done to assist them. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'm, I think we have been assured, um, Stephen, that um, allergies, etc., um, um, are taken into account now. It was a bit touch and go at the beginning, but I'm, I'm pretty sure now that it has been. Um, so, Sharon. Yes. Thank you. I, I heard someone describe uh, this the other day that um, local government are currently the fourth emergency service because they are literally saving people's lives in some instances here, and I think that's true. Uh, my question was about volunteering, Terry. Um, 
both both um, myself and two other people I know who volunteered, like like Stephen's example, we heard nothing for um, over three weeks, nearly four weeks, um, and then were contacted by somebody who sounded like a volunteer themselves, who um, said that we were being offered domiciliary care work with a private care agency, and I said, well, I'm not qualified or experienced to do that. And um, they said, oh, well, can we put you in touch with the agency anyway? Um, the agency then contacted me. They wanted me to do replacement shifts for people that were off sick, doing one-to-one uh, -one care in people's homes. I think I was astonished, frankly, that that was the case. It, the same thing happened to um, two of the other people that spoke to me about this. Um, I, I think if that is happening, it shouldn't be because there are safeguarding issues. Actually, I didn't put, I, I do have a DBS because we all do, but um, I didn't put that down on the thing um, because um, it wasn't, you know, I, I don't I, I don't have any experience in care work. I don't want to be going into people's homes and doing care work because I don't know how to do it. So I hope that isn't, um, that isn't happening. Um, and I'd be grateful some, for some reassurance from Ian that we are not using this volunteering process to fill gaps in the private care sector's um, workforce. Um, Ian. Hi, Sharon. Happy to provide that reassurance. We're not. So, so we, we've got a big recruitment campaign underway, but it's for care workers who will be paid and be trained. Um, what we are doing is when, when people are phoning to say, I'd like to volunteer, then sometimes we're saying, well, you'll get a job. Sometimes that's a that's a natural route, but if they say yes, then we recruit them and we don't into them because, as you say, care work is a, a complex business and not something you can do straight off the street. So, um, hope that provides the reassurance. What what I'd also say, um, just from a, a healthcare adult safeguarding board perspective, is we're very cognizant that unfortunately, at times like these, some people will take advantage and will say they're volunteers and try to gain access or gain people's money. Um, and, um, and and take advantage of people. So we're getting the word out to our professionals and through our Safeguarding Board website about what safeguarding is, how to spot it, how to report it, uh, if, if you know someone who's a recipient of volunteering, and if you are a volunteer uh, and uh, with the best of intentions, how to spot it and what to look for in, in, in other people who are in and around. So we're trying to cover all bases and make sure that, uh, that no one's used. Okay. This, Ian, this was um, a very specific the, the care agency. This was a very specific care agency yeah. I was referred to. Um, I, they were asked, and, and the same with the other two people I spoke to. They, they wanted us to do um, care work in people's homes as a volunteer. That's not on. No, no it's not. So, um, I just don't know what the name of the name of the agency is uh, separately, and I'll look into it, Sharon. Yeah, I think this needs to be looked in at separately outside the meeting, but that's uh, certainly not right. OK, right. So I think we'll just move off of that subject matter, if we may. Um, and then, um, Stephen, your next starter for 10, please. Uh, th thank you, Theresa. 6.2 Adult Care Services update. Uh, we had a pre-meeting yesterday. The third bullet point on 6.21 clearly is incorrect at the last sentence, and that needs to be corrected. Can we have the exact figure? I'm sure we have got rather more than two extra care bed places. Um, it's the, I'll come back to the finance when we have the finance report agenda item three. The 150 nursing beds to increase uh, home care capacity and working with local hotels. Uh, the concern that's been raised generally, and it's not just a Hertfordshire concern, um, it is that people are, and I have this first hand from people who work at Watford General, people have been released from Watford General having not been tested for COVID, sent to a care home, or in some cases a hospice, and then then found to have COVID. So what arrangements are we trying to put in place, like maybe now too late, uh, to, to prevent that occurring in future? Um, because not everyone has been tested in hospital even at this stage, only those admitted with COVID-19 symptoms. And so if the people are being then discharged, how are we assured they are actually transmitting it into a very vulnerable situation that we're actually paying for in terms of a nursing bed? I hope that was understood. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, yes. So Paul, you had questions on this section as well, didn't you? Uh, 
And it, 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 um, I mean, Stephen's covered uh, the first part, which was the factual correction about the two extra care beds. Um, the, the issue that I've got, I think, extends what Stephen was saying, uh, because I have some uh, direct evidence from uh, a, a friend who works in a care home that uh, some of those additional nursing beds are uh, being utilised for end-of-life care for COVID-positive uh, elderly uh, patients. So um, it would appear that the NHS may be moving people who they believe no longer are clinically supportable into a care home setting when they know they're COVID uh, positive um, and expecting the care home to provide palliative care uh, until the end of life. And um, the issue with that is, uh, is, is a fairly serious one, because if, if that is what is happening, those, people's, um, uh, ev those people will eventually, um, unfortunately, pass away, but their death won't be registered for perhaps two, three, four weeks down the line, which means that we're seeing a change in the overall um, uh, statistics on COVID that are not, it's not actually real. It's giving us a false impression of what's happening to the, the uh, fatality statistics on COVID. And I, I'm just concerned that uh, that kind of uh, issue is, is causing uh, us to be um, um, inappropriately optimistic about how we're getting hold of this particular issue. Uh, there is a further issue okay. that uh, my, my, my friend okay. has raised um, in the, apparently uh, it, she her care home is finding it extraordinarily difficult to get any sort of GP attendance uh, on site whatsoever. Um, and, and that's something that I think I'd like uh, Ian to, to perhaps comment on, uh, given that he has those kind of linkages, what's happening with GP services in terms of attendance actually at care homes. OK, fine. Thank you. Ian, would you like to come back on those points, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to go to Stephen's point to start with um, about um, discharging people back to care homes. Um, so wherever possible, we try to get patients tested before they're discharged. That, that's that been very slow to start, but is now part of government policy. So the new National Adult Social Care uh, Plan that was, that was published this week will mean that uh, patients in hospital are tested um, before they're discharged. And if there's a delay of a day or two in the discharge results, then the care home will treat them as a COVID patient and isolate them using all of our um, PPE and um, self-isolation procedures that, that care homes are used to operating. Um, where it wasn't possible to test them prior to discharge, um, then we're following the NHS guidance. So. If the resident wasn't showing symptoms um, for the last seven days, and we might isolate them for a further seven days in the care home, we, we haven't um, been overly forceful in Hertfordshire in forcing care homes that really aren't set up for accepting COVID patients back because of the layout of the building and the way they're staffed to do that. But some care homes are willing to take back COVID patients, either permanently or or temporarily and isolate them and use the PPE and um, infection control procedures um, that Jim and his team have been training, uh, training the care homes on since the start of this period. Um, we're also dealing with um, f fairly um, stringent guidance from the NHS to make sure the hospitals are clear. Um, actually, we've been discharging a lot of people back home to our home care agencies and they've been using PPE, they were on the ITV News. Um, so rather than use care homes, we're actually trying to get a majority of people directly home, um, either self-isolating on their own with care going in or with family members. So we're, we're trying that too. Um, I'm just seeing if I can see Stephen's typing. Um, yeah. Now, so on, on the PPE issues, again, I think, I think we've done slightly better than other areas. The, the government response was slow to start the, the, the stuff that came from the stockpile wasn't fit for purpose. As a county council, we have been buying large quantities of PPE, ironically from China, um, to our warehouse, and we've been distributing that to care homes um, who, who've run out of, run out of supplies. 
Um, we're seeing the supply chain actually pick up in the last week or so, and that is becoming more and more available. Um, and so we, we are we are confident now. I think we're on amber on our risk register that care homes do have an adequate supply. It's a little bit hand to mouth. It's not big stocks in every care home, but where care homes do run out, I personally intervened with two yesterday, then our warehouse is delivering them immediately to those care homes to make sure PPE procedures are, are being followed. On Paul's point about um, end of life, again, it is possible uh, in football. In fact, I know I, I interviewed in, in another where someone actually wanted to leave the hospital to go back to the care home, which is where they lived to pass away. So that was there and the family's wish and so the, the care home enabled that. But it is true to say that when, when a patient no longer will benefit from acute care, then the hospital will say to us, is there any way of discharging this patient, even if it's an end of life pathway? And that is the national guidance we're being told to follow. And so we use all the PPE and all the requirements. The new national action plan on social care actually makes that a little bit easier because there's more on infection control, more on PPE, and importantly, a little bit more on relatives being able to visit and be present for that journey at the end of people's lives, which wasn't possible in the weeks before that was announced. So, again, it's, all this guidance is evolving and changing most weeks, trying to keep it up to date and, and do the best job we can. OK, thanks, Ian. So, Paul, could I ask if you've got any more local issues like that, that you go back to um, Ian with them, OK, outside the meeting? Is that OK? Um, uh, well, I've got I, Rod, I just Rod. Like, uh, we, we didn't get an answer in terms of the statistics, is the only thing I would say, because uh, that was one of the oh. things that was concerning me. Um, and, you know, I was hoping that Ian might answer that. But there's, it's 250 yeah, yeah, I, I can, there, I can not answer it, Paul. I, I think um, I think Jim, Jim may want to come in as well. Um, so the, the national stats that come out every day, you're right, they report hospital deaths. And, and the rationale behind that is that internationally, that's how these deaths are reported. Um, so if someone gets discharged from a hospital back to a care home and passes away there, they wouldn't show in the immediate hospital deaths figure that we receive every day. But we, we it would catch up eventually through, the, through coroners and through death stats, and it's between two and two weeks and 17 days behind. However, again, in the new national guidance this week, the Care Quality Commission are now um, collecting data from care homes on a daily basis. Um, and as soon as that's a robust procedure, they are going to be reporting those care home deaths on a daily basis in the community, as well as the hospital ones. And I'd expect that to be starting very soon. So. Um, Although it's possible that uh, I don't think that would have been the motivation to, to discharge someone home at all, um, but the stats will be catching up because they put that procedure in place with the Care Quality Commission. Okay, thanks, uh, Jim. Did you want to come back with any more? Yeah, the, the 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 issue I think for me is that if if what happens is uh, because of that uh, discharge to the care home. Uh, what we see is uh, a, a flattening of the curve, but an extension of the curve because of the delay in reporting. What we, what we risk is two things. The first is not actually um, see, expecting a tailing off of uh, cases that um, is actually a false tailing off of cases in the early part of the outbreak, followed by a failure for social distancing and other measures put into place to actually have an, a, an effective effect on case levels, but more importantly, the death statistics, meaning that, you know, there's a question mark about whether the, the uh, things that we're doing are actually taking an effect and having an effect. So we're, we're by distorting the statistics in that way, are we not risking um, you know, misinformation about where we are in the, in the outbreak um, sequence. So, Paul, thank you. I've asked Jim to respond to that previously. Yeah, so, could um, you let Jim respond? Uh, I guess Jim. there's several points. The first thing to see is that the hospital statistics are not an accurate figure of where we are in the state of the epidemic curve because. They are purely one source of deaths 
And the reason they reported, as Ian said, is because they reported like that internationally and they reported quickly. Um, the best source of deaths, which is, which is about two weeks behind, is the ONS deaths and the excess deaths because they take into account all of the deaths. Um, the care homes deaths will be taken into account in the ONS death figures, but CQC will get those quicker than the ONS. What we can say about the statistics is that the death rate will lag the infection rate by about two to three weeks. So um, as far as my reading is, we are still heading in the east of England towards the peak. I think we are heading in London. I think they have begun to hit the peak. Uh, it's different in different parts of the UK. And we can't purely rely on death statistics because we will get a very distorted picture. What we have to rely on is a range of sources of data. And I won't go into the detail, but there's about four or five. Um, and there is a weekly epidemiological situation report that we compile. Happy to go into more detail with that with Paul offline, uh, if, if that's helpful. Um, I hope that was fairly clear. Yeah, that, that'll be great. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Paul, so you get the weekly reports, but please do talk to Jim about stats um, in depth after the meeting, if you wish. Um, now, I've now got Ralph that'd like to ask a question on hospices, please. Thanks, Teresa. Um, uh, my, uh, my wife is a trustee at a, at a, at a hospice, um, and she's recently confirmed to me that uh, many... Uh, uh, CCGs are commissioning the hospices to receive uh, those uh, patients who have um, who have developed to a point where uh, the medical systems can't give them much hope for the future. And rather than discharging them back into care homes, it are, are, are commissioning uh, uh, hospices to receive them and to provide them with the uh, the end of life care that they need. Do we know whether the uh, the uh, CCG or the, the the hospital trusts in Hertfordshire are doing similar uh, work in terms of, of trying to uh, direct those uh, those uh, very poorly patients into the hospice system? Um, who wants to take that? Is that you, Ian, or Jim? Jim. Jim, could you take that, please? Um, Yes, um, uh, very quickly, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, there are end-of-life care pathways in place and there are end-of-life care protocols, particularly for COVID. So I, I'm also a hospice trustee uh, and, and there is a national palliative care pathway for COVID um, as well as a, as a set of local protocols in the CTBs along that. And it is part of the tactical coordinating work that we're doing across the health economy. Okay, great. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next subject matter. I'm going to take it in order now. That it seems the easiest. Um, so if we can move on to children's services. Stephen, did you have a question around children's services? Yeah, yes. Yes. I do. Thank you, Teresa. It's 6.4 in particular, and it's the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point down in connection with the free school meals uh, and the school vouchers. Uh, it's a question of access uh, to the free school meals, uh, how they're being delivered, what's the situation with uh, self-isolated families. Uh, I'm getting reports coming through that the families that are self-isolated have been told they have to go and collect them from the school. And again, it comes back to the dietary issue I referred to earlier. They don't have a choice of meal. They're just given what the school has, has presented. And in some cases, it doesn't fit the dietary requirements of the children who seem to have a, a larger range of dairy-free uh, art products. So, you know, if someone was given a cheese pie, well, they can't eat that. Um, so it's what we're doing in twofold with the vouchers, how we're getting access to people in type of preschool, not, not at school, and why and, and and the choice of meals. Okay. Um Marion, you're on the call. Are you able to help? Uh I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, I can. <laughs> oh, you can. Okay. 
So yeah. in so the government has a scheme um, that says all children who are eligible for free school meals, whether or not they're attending school, will be able to get free school meals during this period. And that's what we are administering. So we don't need to worry about children who actually aren't key workers' children because they are still receiving the free meals. What we have talked with schools about is that it is in many cases preferable to actually provide the child with a meal rather than provide the family with vouchers. And we know that the schools will know their families and the schools will be helping to persuade families where we think it's most appropriate that they are actually given a meal to take up the offer. There are vouchers that are provided by the government, um, which are being sent out to families who have to travel a long way. So we're not expecting families um, to travel a great distance to pick up a meal. We do acknowledge, and, and the government voucher scheme has been working in some cases, hasn't been working in other cases, and in those cases, we've been talking to schools about giving families vouchers for local supermarkets and then retrospectively claiming back from the Department for Education. And that has also been being used. We do acknowledge that um, there isn't a choice and the range um, and where the school is not able to provide a choice or to meet dietary requirements. Again, we're promoting the use of the voucher instead of the meal. Um, and Hearts for, no, not Hearts for Learning, Hertfordshire, Kate, Hearts Catering Limited, they are offering a choice. They're offering vegetarian food, um, but not all schools buy into Hearts Catering. And basically, I think we have an ongoing dialogue with all our schools about how they're meeting the varying needs of the children who are their pupils. And this is just part of that ongoing conversation. And schools are doing the best that they can. Yeah. So, so Stephen, on that, I would actually say if you do have particular local issues, as you obviously have a school that's refusing to um uh, wanting families to come in um can you refer those perhaps to um simon newland and he can take it up in specifically and look how we can work around that i'm sure there are ways if pet families are isolating there might be even local help groups that can help and deliver um uh, uh, yeah, so, I, I, can, I can do that but it's more than just one school i mean examples are coming through you know because of the way the school system works Parents who live around the corner from me have to drive five miles to their primary school because that's the allocation policy and five miles back to pick up the free school meal. Now, and, the, and I have to do it, and the, obviously, that in, in addition to their shopping, so it's not actually it's the essential journey. And they've actually been stopped by the police once saying, Why are you going out? Why can't you have the meal at home? What, what the answer that wasn't given, or what happens to those families? that are now having to do okay. the 14 so, day isolation, generally across the I piece. Think we, um, How do they um, get their vouchers? We will come back to you on that one, Stephen. We haven't got an, an answer at this moment in time, because I don't think Simon Newland's actually on the call, um, but we'll have to come back to you on that one, all right? That, that's, I've taken that on board. I'll come back to you on that. Um, is there, I've got some other questions that have come through. Um, around um, teenagers, mental health support. Um, there's some questions around um, domestic abuse as well. We'll take that in this section, if we may. Um, Marion, do you want to comment on what um, children's services are doing around teenage mental health support? And then perhaps I could come back to Jim as well on that. And also, can you, Marion, also talk about domestic abuse um, and what you know around that area. Sadly, Jenny had to leave the call. So um, we'll, we'll go with what we can at this moment in time. So um, Marion. <laughs> yes, um, 
so regarding teenage mental health, we are working both with services that sit within the council and with local mental health colleagues to make sure that we are advertising a whole range of different support offers from self-help to online to telephone counselling. Um, I know that MIND have recently set up a specific project for care leavers. They also have mm -hmm. an online platform for young people. We have COOTH, which is an online platform for young people. And these offer one-to-one -one sessions through texting, chatting, but they also offer one-to-one -one telephone sessions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's just about, Ian talked about how we were putting out information about adult safeguarding. And in a very similar way, we're trying to put out information through a whole range of sources about both mental health and about domestic abuse. So we're using social media, we're contacting community services that are still out, we're, provide, we're sending emails to young people that are open to children's services, trying to help them access the support that is still available. And then our mental health colleagues, HPFT and HCT, are really focusing on crisis support. So the early help has been about boosting the use of online and virtual communication. HPFT and HCT are focusing their staff resources on dealing with crisis support for young people with mental health problems. So our crisis services have been boosted during this period and are still available and they are still doing home visits and they are still doing face-to-face -face appointments with young people in crisis. In terms of domestic abuse, we are very clear that that families who or that, that people who are victims of domestic abuse are going to find it less easy to contact our services um, and adult care services, services and community services during this period of time because they aren't going to be left alone. Um, and so what we're doing is, is, as I've mentioned, trying to promote access to email, so, so where people normally telephone domestic abuse services, we've put stuff on social media reminding people that there are email links because it can often be easier to send an email, there can be communication via an email, our refuges are, or access to refuges is still an option for individuals and our housing colleagues are still very alert and are offering support and alternative accommodation in the normal way. Okay, thank you, Maren. Jim, have you got anything you want to add? Uh, very briefly, um, as Marion says, there's a group that's working, uh, there's a couple of public health people engaged in that process. We've also done some specific COVID work on Just Talk, which is our young people's campaign. And there is a group that is working um, across uh, the whole system, looking at making sure that we take a whole system approach to mental health promotion and resilience. Um, we're very happy to do more. Um, we've actually got uh, our school nurses, those who haven't been deployed into clinical response, also working on mental health and young people. So um, we're very keen to do uh, whatever we need to on this because we don't want an epidemic of mental ill health on the back of the epidemic of COVID. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. So hopefully, oh, so we're then on to, uh, we spoke about domestic abuse. Um, so, Judy, I know you said you could offer a response from the police angle. Um, can we leave that for now? And um, I, I know that there's a lot going on in the partnership. And there's... Well, it was about teenage mental health, actually. 
Okay. And how about links to something? domestic abuse? Yeah, which which might sound bizarre, but actually, the uh, so quite a lot of the increase that police have been dealing with in domestic abuse cases has actually been sort of secondary uh, abuse in terms of teenagers uh, living in pressure cooker conditions, um, not being able to cope with each other. And I just wondered whether the um, the mental health services were liaising with the police in terms of those. Um, teenagers who the police have been trying to deal with in a as low a key way as possible, but I'm not sure that that is one bit that is joined up. That was the point I wanted to make. And so it is about domestic abuse and teenage mental health and the police and the joining up. Thank you. Um, Marion, do you want to comment on that? You have to one. Um, yes, I think the, the link between the police and mental health is very often our targeted service for adolescents. So the, the young people who are causing or who are coming to the attention of the police because of child on parent violence very often no. are referred into our targeted youth support services, which is now called Sash, a specialist mm -hmm. adolescent service Hertfordshire and that service is still working with a lot of these young people and does have both its own mental health workers within the team but also has very good links with um, HPFT and our CAMS services so our SASH mm -hmm. service very much Oh, it's child on child. Um, yes, yeah. again, because child on child becomes child protection if a child is putting often a sibling at risk. So again, it will be referred in by the police to social care. So we do have a live and ongoing dialogue mm -hmm. between children's services and the police in all sorts of ways. We have risk panels. Mm -hmm have our normal referral routes we have a joint front door where we work with the police so we are trying to pick up those cases but i do have mm -hmm. to acknowledge that providing support virtually even though we have now got a whole range of video conferencing facilities available to us is sometimes not the same as providing support directly into the family. We do have support agencies, we have support hours, we have Hearts Practical Parenting, who's an agency that work with us, particularly deal with adolescent violence within the home. They're still working, we've commissioned additional hours because we recognise that these families are under particular stress at the moment uh, because they're all cooped up in one house. So we offer online um, parenting support, helping parents manage their young people's behaviour. But it's a challenge. Thank you. Yes, Judy, that is one, that's one thing that I, I thought about right at the beginning of this particular pandemic. I just thought about the young teenagers shut up yeah. um, and it really is an issue. And that's going to be one of the risk factors for us going through this whole whole time. Um, so, um, t uh, Tim, did you want to add something? I think it's important to emphasise that uh, all the agencies are meeting together on a regular basis, so they should be exchanging a lot of this information, and I'm fairly confident that they are. Um, I know Jim is currently looking at putting a webinar together for young people, I think on the 7th of May is a provisional date to discuss mental health issues. So uh, there is some work going on. I'm not suggesting it's a perfect solution at the moment, but uh, we're working at it. everybody. Terry, did we lose Terry there? 
Can it, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll, whilst, whilst Terry, hello, Terry. He's back. He's back. Ah. I'm getting, I don't know what keeps happening here. Sorry. Um, I, um, shall we go on to environment and infrastructure? Does anybody have any questions on that? Yeah. I, I do, Terry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, uh, a, a couple here, actually, because it covers three areas. Uh, the highways update, Eurovia. It's what contractual issues we have with them, and indeed other contractors, if they can't carry out the work. And um, if we're out of uh, lockdown, but Erovia can't get up to speed, what arrangements can be made to try and get some of the work done that was planned by them? Um, and that's on paragraph 651. On 652, um, it's the issue, and I have had conversations with highway officers, and I've got a, a brief, another, meet, uh, another video conference with them next week. It's the issue over gully cleansing, grass cutting, keeping cycleways and footpaths clear. Um, and I have raised concerns that if the lockdown continues and we don't do any of this, some of these paths will be totally overgrown. I've already sent examples in of ones that are two thirds overgrown. And I think we have to be proactive. If we, we can't just not cut any of this till September, because you know people are being encouraged to go out for healthy walks or cycles, yet many of these routes now are so narrow, we're actually causing a social distancing problem. Um, on the commit, the household waste issue and fly tipping, I know the government directive last week was to encourage to hope open household waste sites. And I wonder what the county's view on that. I, I think personally, uh, and I think the view of my, my group, and I know Steve and others will come in, is probably premature given the wrong message it sends and the, the long queues we're likely to get. But related to that, I, uh, the county seems to be very slow at clearing fly tipping that is occurring on roads. And I wonder whether we need to, to be a little bit more proactive on that. Uh, and whether we need to get a message out, I'm getting reports that a lot of people now are burning stuff in their gardens. I know it's an environmental health issue for the districts, uh, but I wonder if we can get a county-wide message out. They should not be doing that. And related to that, okay. on the, oh, the six on seven, it's the final one, Teresa. Six, seven is the transport environment update part of this, which is to come to our rights of way, which we all had an email newsletter encourage us to use the rights of way. Uh, and go out and exercise, but it comes back to the same point. Um, I've had a complaint from residents saying, well, it's all very old trying to confuse us, but they'd be blocked off by farmers, blocked off by uh, barge holders on the, and Ralph may well have had this as well, um, uh, on the uh, the River Game, and the Canal, Canal River I try to trust is having to go back and clear the uh, rights of way and paths are being blocked off by other people. Um, okay, oh, that's quite a lot there. <laughs> okay, so um, Mark, are you on the call? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So you've got yes, several you, things you've there. Got several things there. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, good order. Uh, in terms of Eurovia uh, and contract arrangements, oh, we've got a number of contracts, a number of different contracting arrangements, and we're working through with each provider what the what the right answer is. That's an example for uh, Keeleys, who should be doing this dressing program uh, and can't be doing that at the moment, are in discussion with us about um, us covering the cost of materials. So we'll have the materials stored somewhere for future use. Um, uh, so we're doing those sorts. The Aerovia are now hoping to restart uh, works in May uh, and on through a, a risk assessment and a change of working practices to enable them to um, we the emails that have come out to members to inform of what we're trying to do at the moment. And um, we're looking to prioritise around areas that we can that are busy normally or where we can easily do uh, Probably not focusing too, too much on residential areas because obviously 
a lot of those have parked cars, but we are we are rag racing each of the roads and trying to work out which ones we can get in and do and which ones we can't uh, over the over the next few months. So so that work is being. In terms of gully emptying, grass cutting, etc., we'll be starting grass cutting um, next week uh, down in uh, I think there's a Hartsmere area to start with. Um, and we work around the bits where we are responsible. Obviously, uh, our district colleagues do grass. Some of the areas that I know as well in Hatfield resident that uh, they're out cutting at the moment as well. So um, hopefully that will help. Uh, and we're reviewing all the other activities that we do in relation to public health, England advice and a discussion with Jim to make sure that we've got practices that enable us to do as much as we can uh, and keen to have the support of members uh, regarding you know, some uh, unfortunate responses from the public around the fact that people are out there doing doing their work as government advice is to stay at home where you can but it's also uh, that they will just continue to try and keep the world moving so um so we're trying to to do that delicate balance in terms of hwrc's um i think uh, i think uh, even is right that it's uh, it's premature to think about opening at this time we have five of our not uh collecting garden waste from, from the household, uh, and we have some that are not doing bulky waste collection. I think we need to work with our district colleague, uh, my government's desires, find a way of getting to a place where we can open it, but we can't do that until, until we can properly um, socially, until, until people are comfortable with a, uh, that, that is essential piece of work uh, for, for uh, the public to do in terms of their travel. So I think uh, over the next three weeks we'll we'll take the reviewing, but unless the rules, my advice would be that we ought to be we ought to be doing that. So um, Council's quite right. In fact, I know that uh, well, Hatfield indeed have put uh, notices out to people asking them not to light the bonfires. It is a district function um, with a waste partnership. Um, to try and work together on communication with the public. Uh, finally, in terms of rights of way, uh, yes, we are having to carry out some enforcement around people who are um, trying to, uh, to obstruct rights of way. Uh, that's unfortunate, um, uh, uh, and people are clearly worried about, um, about the impact of the virus, uh, and we understand that, but that shouldn't uh, prevent people from using public rights of way. Um, so we'll need to be working with the enforcement teams to try and make sure that the all the but of course, we are a relatively small team, so we do need people to let us know where those blockages are so that we can do something about them. Okay. Can I, can I just come back on two points and, th and thank Mark uh, for that quick summary? Um, it's the Canal and Riverside Trust that needs to be some work done with them uh, in connection with uh, Rivergate. And I did wonder, uh, and obviously on the variable message signs that go up and the messages up about speeding, um, wh whether we could at least once or twice put messages up, don't have bonfires, I don't know. It might help a little bit. Um, but the obnoxious smell of, of burning rubber from, build, from builders who are still carrying out work because they can't take it to house our waste sites uh, or commercial sites is really affecting people who are self-isolated and only have their gardens. So the more we can do on that, and I think Judy wanted to come in on that uh, that, that point uh, as well. But um, yeah, I think Thank you. yeah, th thanks for that. That's it. Oh, sorry, yeah. one other thing. Thank can we please please go back to when there are, there's a media story in the Watford Observer today? about Ringway doing unessential work. Actually, it does look like Ringway staff in the photograph, uh, but it just needs to be responded to because it's a very negative story. They were clearly out there doing a proper job. Uh, uh, and I know some staff have been um, verbally spoken to in unseemly manners, uh, and we need to address that. So can we also address the media stories when they're clearly wrong? Thank you, Stephen. Um, Judy, you wanted to come back on bonfires? Yeah, Stephen made the point about it, it being an issue mostly for um, district environmental health areas, but actually um, our own fire service and the police are also taking it very seriously in terms of the messages that need to be given out about it. And it also came up in our meeting yesterday. But I also added to that, I mean, if you talk about things like burning rubber and burning almost anything other than garden waste, 
There is also the issue that we're now identifying the most vulnerable people and shielding them in many ways. Many of them have problems to do with their lungs. And getting a lung full when you're in isolation of other people's noxious burnings is another risk factor. And so yeah. it's something that should be added into the discussion about bonfires. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, Owen, are you able to take that or feed that back to Daryl for the Local Resilience Forum? Um, but this is something across Hertfordshire, really, we need to work together on and get that message out, especially for the next three weeks. Uh, yes, I, I will. Uh, it's worth uh, pointing out that um, uh, all of the waste, uh, of the lead waste officers from across Hertfordshire, both district and county, are working together uh, on all waste issues. I'm speaking to the district chief execs twice a week. Uh, so both through the um, strategic coordinating group and through the district chief exec coordination, we'll make sure that we're all joined up about um, messages about fires and um, planning our way out of uh, the closure of the, the, the waste sites and the curbsides. Okay, that's excellent. Thanks very much. So does anybody else have any more questions on the environment section? Or can we move on? I'm very conscious that we've still got fi finance to talk about. Um, the only point Mark didn't answer was where there has been dumping of blocked roads uh, and making sure it is cleared speedily because as as services need Mark, to get down those roads, it needs to be cleared. Yeah. So Stephen, um, Mark did say that they've got to work with, they are working with people around that. And I think the thing is that the right, you just need to let the rights of way team know enforcement. Um, Mark, what's the best way of letting uh, the teams know, please? Uh, well, um, use the use the members' uh, email address and email, and email it in um, for us. And uh, yes, we'll work with colleagues to clear that. Um, and thank you for the comments of the um, Watford Observer, uh, uh, Stephen. Um, absolutely agree. Uh, and we'll I'll speak to uh, Press PR about getting something in response to that. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else got anything else on transport or environment? No, lovely. Um, then move on to community protection. Anything on that? Ooh, no, right. Um, public, Tim, do you want to come in at all here? I actually wanted to come in, come in earlier, actually, but um, I just wanted to say, you know, while we were early on saying what a wonderful job everyone was doing, and I, I think that's right. Um, I'd just like to, to, to commend the public health team in the, in the county. They've been working on this really for, for several weeks now. It's not just happened since the lockdown and, uh, you know, through the period of contain and delay. Um, and I think a whole lot of people worked extremely well uh, with the result that actually we achieved what we initially set out to achieve to make sure that um, we were able to deal with the, with the, the peaks as, as it came along. So, I wanted to say thank you to all those people that were involved. Um, but I also wanted to mention that the one group of people I don't think we have thanked as a group are the people of Hertfordshire. I think the response to the lockdown has been magnificent, really. I know there have been exceptions, but by and large, I think well over 90% of people have stuck to it. And those figures are starting to show in the infection rates now. So I think we should say thank you to those. Um, and also, just I'd like to add my thanks to the people who are volunteering to help, um, not just the formal groups, but the local, local informal groups, certainly on my patch. Uh, an awful lot of people are going out of their way to help their neighbours, to help old people. And I think it's absolutely magnificent. And I, I just wanted to add my thanks to those people as well. Uh, they probably aren't known to, to us, and uh, we won't know who they are in the future, but uh, they know who they are, and I think we should say we're very grateful to them. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tim. Does anybody else have anything else on public health? Um, could I just comment that I think it's um, really interesting that more people are wanting to give up smoking. So that's a real plus for us because I know that public health have had a struggle actually getting more people to come on and to see smoking. So that's going to help our everybody's health in general going forward. So that's a, a plus from something that's not so good. Um, has anybody else got anything else on public health? 
Can I just say, Terry, just thank you for raising that because it's um, people who smoke aren't more susceptible to, to contracting COVID-19, uh, but they're certainly more susceptible to the, the more extreme impact of it. Um, and we've had now over 800 referrals from GPs and the, the number's going up. So uh, that's a really important thing that you've raised. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's a really important area. Okay, thank you. So um, we'll go on to resources. Can, shall we leave that? Well, no, it's not finance, isn't it? So anything on resources? No? Okay, legal and democratic. Libraries. So hello, hello, it's Stephen here. Yeah. yeah, just one general question, Teresa, across the county per se. To, uh, if I've missed it, I apologise. Has there been a general figure of number of staff that have actually um, self-isolating uh, at home? I what, are, what is our workforce figure per se? Uh, and I suppose the same goes with, do we have any scope of what's happening with uh, our subcontractors on that? So, Owen, are you able to respond, please? Uh, so, yes, I've just uh, uh, asked Scott to uh, to see if uh, he's got a more accurate figure. I think we were planning for anything up to 20%. Uh, we've been monitoring and we think that um, it's been rare to have more than 10% absence due to uh, illness or isolation. Uh, but I uh, want to uh, just invite Scott. He might have the, the latest numbers from HR. Thank you. Uh, cool. thank, yep, yep. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, uh, Councillor Heritage and, and Owen. Um, yeah, the uh, the figures that uh, are still well below our, uh, our worst case planning assumptions, as uh, already um, Ian had mentioned earlier in some of his updates. And uh, the latest updates we've had today uh, was all services are working within their um, um, their business continuity plan staffing limits at the moment. Regarding our um, uh, uh, contractors, um, I believe that there are. Uh, some areas, such as the uh, through the Amy contract, there's been pressures within the staffing resources there. But again, they've still been able to maintain the services that they've been uh, that they've been asked um, from us to provide. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is that okay? So I think I think actually, um, just talking about my own service, um, certainly the number of absences hasn't been as high as we anticipated. So I'm not quite sure if we've got that to come or. We, or not, but all the social distancing is really working, which is really, really good. So um, fingers crossed on that one, because I don't want anybody getting ill. Um, so taking the rest of the paper to the end, are there any other questions I, that anybody has? Because I'm very keen to get onto the finance part. No? Okay, well, in that case, I'll say thank you very much to everybody. That was um, a long haul, but really worthwhile. And um, the um, recommendation actually to us, um, which is on page seven of the agenda, is that the special cabinet panel notes this report. Well, I think we've done that well and truly. So thank you very much to members and officers. Um, so moving on to item three, if I might, um, a finance update in response to COVID-19. Um, please, could I ask Scott to report, to give a presentation, please? Yep. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Heritage. Okay, so um, this report um, was in our previous update report was included within the uh, the general update we provided. But the uh, the world of uh, of local government finance and the announcements that have come from government have been uh, quite significant over over the last few weeks. Um, so what we we'll try to do with this report is now. Uh, Provide a briefing for both uh, the special cabinet panel and uh, and cabinet next week on the financial challenges that we're now forecasting that we're facing, um, with some also some information that's been kindly provided by our district colleagues, also um, and also uh, with a recommendation to. Um, uh, include uh, a financial package to support our services and communities uh, going forward. So um, 
In terms of just some key headlines I'll pick up from uh, the report, obviously, again, there's quite a lot of detail uh, within that. Um, but at a national level, um, there's been two significant sums that have been announced by government so far, 1.6 billion related to COVID pressures, um, and also 1.8 billion uh, for business rate reliefs, uh, given a total uh, package of uh, 3.4 billion. Um, of that, um, uh, of that 1.6 billion, uh, a grant of 26.1 million has uh, been re uh, received by uh, the county council. Um, but uh, I think it's well noted in talking with the district council CFOs, a much smaller grant um, has been received for them in relation to their uh, their budgets uh, and the pressures that they're uh, experiencing. Uh, the sum that we've received is unring fenced, um, although uh, the expectation that the majority of that of that sum is being directed towards uh, adult social care and, and children services. Um, there's been a number of uh, uh, schemes that have been put in place to support our businesses, a small uh, business uh, grant uh, scheme. Um, that is providing sums of up to £10,000 uh, to our smaller businesses uh, within across Hertfordshire that's been administered by our district councils, um, but also depending on uh, if you're within the retail, hospitality and leisure sector, um, there's also additional grants of up to £25,000 for them also. Um, there's council tax reliefs that are being provided as well, um, but again, feedback that we're receiving from districts is, is that um, if they're applied to those people that are currently in receipt of, of council tax support, uh, it's likely that all those reliefs that have been allocated would all be used up, um, providing very little headroom for um, uh, support to be able to be provided to uh, 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 individuals that are now falling within the scope of council tax support going forwards. Um, the, the scale of, uh, of the impact to us going forward um, is, is, is tr we've I've tried to include some sensitivity analysis within this report. Again, this is extremely fast moving, but um, if uh, uh, there is a, a hit on the collection of council tax across the, across the county, uh, then a 1% reduction in council tax yield uh, for us at the county council will be in the region of a £6 million pressure. Um, there are delays in uh, universal credit. I think you probably will have seen the uh, national headlines of an extra, I think it was about a 1 million um, extra universal uh, credit applications um, over, recent, over recent weeks. Um, and as a result of that, um, uh, there is obviously going to be delays that will follow, um, but then that will have a direct impact on the support council tax. Um, uh, and the amount that people will be paying in council tax uh, going forwards um, as well. As far as how we've been analysing our cost pressures within the county council, we've taken a sort of a five category approach. Um, we've been looking at the costs that we've, um, um, extra costs that we've been incurring. So a good example of that in relation to the social care providers in supporting them. The risks that we, uh, second categories around risk, uh, such as children's services in relation to short-term placements. Income loss on things like council tax I've already mentioned, but also our trading entities. Uh, four is undeliverable savings, and I think with the uh, the focus that has now quite rightly been placed on our response to COVID, has mean that we've ne uh, we've meant uh, we've needed to move our, our focus away from the savings that we're meant to be delivering uh, for this year, of which is already uh, totaling seventeen million pound of savings uh, to be delivered this year. And then there's the knock-on effects of the capital uh, delays um, as well. So when we bring all that together into our medium-term financial strategy and uh, and integrated plan, um, you know we are, we're now forecasting pressures for ongoing costs um, as we um, not only as we carry on through the response to COVID, but also as we move back to uh, business as usual and whatever that now looks like uh, in a post-COVID world. Um, council tax collection and the pressure on um, on both our districts and, and their abilities to pay their precepts and therefore the knock-on impact on our cash flow. 
Um, the impact on the economy uh, and what that could ha have uh, impact on the business rate yields as well. Um, and then um, people may re remember there was this thing called a spending review. Um, and um, at some point that may well have come back to the fore, um, but I've got a feeling that won't be for some time as well. And then just to, to finish, the, in, relate, in response to the economy, the, the Council has made the decision uh, to already uh, make arrangements to, for our suppliers, that anyone that in, invoices us, that as soon as that invoice is cleared for payment, that is paid in the next payment run, and not we don't take that payment out to terms such as a 30-day payment terms. We pay that straight away, um, and we are equally uh, involved uh, in the economic resilience cell for Hertfordshire, so as we uh, exit it out of COVID that we can ensure that the Hertfordshire economy uh, is given all the support from both us and, uh, and our partners that are a part of that group. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, okay, so I've got Ralph uh, followed by Sharon. Ralph. Please, uh, uh, first, I'd just like to thank the finance team for um, trying to keep a track of what's been going on in relation to the um, uh, the uh, COVID crisis that we've uh, we've been faced with, the, uh, the, the the finance the finances surrounding it have been very fluid. Um, we're we're working on lots of estimates. We're trying to bring together lots of uh, disparate uh, bits of information. And uh, the report, I think, uh, as far as it can be, is as close to where we think we are as possible. Um, there are two questions I, I would like to put to Scott, uh, which are um, uh, hopefully will draw out some important issues from my perspective, at least. Um, uh, the council's budget for 2020 is about 850 million. The government grant is uh, is 26 million. It's a small proportion of our overall expenditure, and it's it and it, it and is meant to cover the additional costs associated with the impact of COVID-19. We collect so some £600 million in council tax each year, and according to the table on page five, as you pointed out, 5.81% reduction in council tax is equivalent to a million pound uh, uh, amount. Uh, can you give us an explanation of what impact uh, uh, the reduction of, a, of the council tax collection would be? Who's, and for, for, for those, those who might be watching us from, from outside the council, Who's responsible for collecting it, and how does it reach the county council, and how uh, uh, any reductions in its receipt might impact the county council's budget balances for both this year and next year? That's the first question. Uh, and the second question, which I consider to be uh, of, of paramount importance, the county council has received 26 million for, from government to meet the COVID-19 pressures. Our best estimate is that we will incur some £35 million pounds of additional costs or reductions in our revenue receipts. In paragraph 9, the options to meet the potential shortfall are explained. I'm sure members will be most interested to ensure that the Council receives full compensation from central government for the shortfall between current funding and the costs of the, of the impact of COVID-19. Can you explain what action is being taken to ensure the impact of COVID-19 on local government finances being, is being explained to central government, and what actions are being taken to lobby government for additional funding to meet that gap? Okay, sorry, can, can you hear me? I think I've been muted by the chair. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so if if, if maybe I I just take uh, the uh, your second question uh, first, um, uh, Councillor Sangster. Um, over uh, as as councillors may be aware that um, MHCLG have asked all councils uh, within England to make returns on their COVID pressures um, that uh, they have been experiencing, and we need to do that now once a week. Um, the Society of County Treasurers um, have now managed to analyse that overnight. Um, and uh, just hot off the press, um, so apologies, my portfolio holder, you don't even know this, um, is that um, the, the the summary position is um, is that 
um, with all of the, um, uh, this is from a county council perspective, with all of those pressures identified across county councils within England, uh, the additional spend and income reduction for 2021 far exceeds the emergency funding that's been allocated so far. Uh, the analysis shows that SCT members, Society of County Treasurers members, face a net effect of 2.06 billion uh, in 2021 uh, against an allocation of 679 million. So, so far we would be 1.38 billion short of the funding we would need effectively to square off the impact of COVID on our finances and therefore not fall on the local council taxpayer. So, using the same distribution, the government would need to triple the emergency funding allocated to us so far. So I hope that, that covers your, your first question. Um, in terms of how, if that funding wasn't um, forthcoming, then as the report outlines, there's almost a, uh, a hierarchy of how we would go funding it, from finding in-year savings, uh, from starting to access in-year contingencies, to starting to access our reserves. But on the sorts of sums that we're talking about, and bearing in mind a lot of these pressures have been identified for only the first phase of this response, which is three, four month period, you start extrapolating these figures for a, a period of six months, nine months without the appropriate government support, that would start having impact on, forget about just the Hertfordshire County Council, councils and local government as a, as a, as a whole. Um, and in terms of uh, lobbying and uh, responding, then that is, I understand, being undertaken for all our groups, such as the County Council's Network, the Association of Chief uh, County Chief Executives, um, and the LGA and Regional LGA. Um, um, if I just, um, sorry, apologies, Councillor. No, that's fine, that's fine, thank you. Carry on. Okay, so uh, just going to the second question, uh, sorry, your first question, which was in relation to council tax payments and um, and, and the impact um, of uh, reduction in council tax yield. Um, as it, as it stands at the moment, the way that the system works is, is that ourselves, um, the, pub, uh, the police and crime commissioner and the district council themselves all identify a preset within their budget when they set that in February. And as a result of that, um, the Hearts Chief Finance Officers all agree a, uh, a schedule of payments called, called a preset. Uh, that is paid. So the local district council will make a payment from the council tax they've collected that they put in something called a collection fund, um, which is a, a separate account from their uh, general uh, general budget. And they make payments to us on, uh, uh, on a monthly basis. On, on an agreed schedule. Obviously, uh, the way that they will uh, forecast that is, is that they would they tend to identify um, a, a payment rate to us that is probably a little bit lower than what they're likely to uh, to, uh, to actually uh, uh, receive in, in council tax during the course of the year. That's normal practice to min uh, minimise their risk. And at the end of the year, that's all then worked out, and there tends to be um, a payment. Uh, the balance is then paid to the police and crime commissioner and county um, at the end of the year once it's all worked out. However, if uh, which I've not seen in my career before, but if there ever is a point where actually the amount of council tax that is collected by, by the district is not sufficient to meet their preset payment, uh, with the both to the county council for their own needs at a district level and uh, um, and to the county council, um, then that that will be a situation where um, the local district council would need either to borrow short term. And therefore, that cost would fall on the uh, district council and the lo local council taxpayer, or it would fall on us um, if we decided to renegotiate uh, our preset payments. Um, at the moment, my stance has been that our expectation is preset payments are made. Um, but if any district is likely to come up short based on their projections, um, we would then enter into discussions at, at that point. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, so I've got um, Sharon, then Bob, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a, a few points on this, and I want to go back to my point I made right at the start. 
start the meeting about the very concerning um, response that I understand colleagues from the LGA had in a call on Tuesday evening where it looked as though the Secretary of State might be rowing back on the pledge to support uh, local government to do whatever, to use their words, whatever was necessary um, to support our community uh, through the lockdown. Um, that uh, is of great concern. I know the LGA has been um, uh, in constant contact with MHCLG. Um, we had a call with um, Alex Skinner, who's the finance officer for MHCLG um, on Wednesday. Um, and I think the his response really was, we need the data, and that's the data that's being collected from the questionnaires that Scott spoke about. I understand 340 questionnaires went back in yesterday, uh, which was a very high response rate for local government. Um, and hopefully when they've got the data in front of them, I think the Treasury will probably have a nervous breakdown. Um, and I don't know what happened in MHCLG, but uh, we have to um, hold the government's feet to the front in terms of keeping to their pledge because we quite a lot of us and the county council is the same in this respect we have spent the money we've needed to spend to do the job we needed to do and i i simply don't think it's acceptable for the government to tell us to do that and then row back on that promise so i know it's going to be a big sum and uh, you know it's helpful scott that you've provided uh, the county council's analysis of that um, the district councils are no doubt doing the same but um, they have to keep to that promise. So I hope we do see that. Um, I have some more specific uh, questions. We're looking at um, costs, um, loss of income, and savings not achieved when we're looking at what's going on here. Um, and um, particularly uh, looming very quickly over the horizon, uh, you will all be aware that a pay award was made, a further pay award was made today of 2.75%. That was rejected by the unions. Um, so on top of the current financial issues, we've also got uh, a pay award that needs to be uh, sorted out. And um, I'd be interested in uh, Scott's comments on that, because what the LGA have said to government is um, if, uh, the, if there's going to be a higher pay award than that and everybody recognises what local government staff have been doing, we've been talking about it all morning, um, then the government need to meet the gap because uh, 2.75 is absolutely the maximum. And, you know, there was quite a lot of discussion about going to that on the pay award. Um, so that's one issue. Um, the the um, second issue is around the uh, issue you mentioned, Scott, about the structuring of the preset uh, payments. It's really, I think, for districts, it's a bit early to tell um, what's going to happen in terms of uh, payment uh, delays for people's council tax payments. They, um, we, we think, uh, from talking to my district colleagues, that uh, they might not have, um, they might not have um, cancelled their April direct debit, but that might come forward um, as we go through April, uh, as the uh, financial constraints that people are under start to buy it. But we, we don't really know that. But I'm grateful for your assurance, Scott, that districts can come and have a conversation um, if that uh, if there is a, a case of not getting enough uh, money in. Um, yesterday, uh, district council colleagues were um, uh, all of the same opinion that it's too early to tell yet. Um, the next point I wanted to make was about the write-off of debts. We've seen £13 billion pounds worth of National Health Service debt written off at the stroke of a pen. Um, all of us in local government um, have borrowings, and I hope we will be lobbying uh, for a similar, uh, if, we, if, we, um, if we are to get additional payments to help us with the costs, uh, that would be better. But if we can have our debt, some of our debt written off, uh, that would be uh, helpful as well. Um, the next point was on the business grants. There have been some issues in getting these out in some parts of the county. Um, it's much more difficult where you've got a lot of small businesses who don't pay currently pay business rates. You won't necessarily have their contact details. Contacting businesses at this time is difficult because they are closed and not on their usual uh, contact numbers. So um, my view is that the government providing league tables of who hasn't and hasn't uh, paid out these business grants is very unhelpful. We're all Absolutely. None of us want to see businesses not getting this grant, these grants that they're entitled to. So we need to uh, continue to resist the league table approach and continue to get those grants out as quickly as possible. 
Next points on the hardship fund. You're quite right, Scott, that the because the government we thought the money was going to come unring fenced. It didn't. It uh, was very specific that government wanted £150 additional council tax support given to every recipient of that. So we've had to do that. That's left very little money to um, support anybody else that is suffering uh, from a hardship in terms of their council tax. Um, and um, my last point was around the recovery plan and how we um, are going to work on that as a county council. Clearly, um, a lot depends on what government decide. We were, um, I think some of us were expecting another tranche of support for local government in finance terms. And just to put it in perspective, county got 26 million. Districts got, we, my district got 45,000. You've got that in the paper, the figures for those. Um, we currently got 50 people in um, hotel accommodation because they're homeless and we had to take them off the streets. So you can imagine how long 45,000 lasts if you've got 50 people in hotel beds. So um, the, the funding was insufficient. I hope we'll get another announcement too. But we do need to work on the recovery plan. And I'd like to ask Scott how we're going to do that. Thank you. Sorry, that was a bit long, but this is my, my specialist subject. <laughs> I suspect you've asked all the questions everybody else wanted to ask, Sharon. So, Scott, please. OK, if you, if you uh, can hear me. Um, if, if it's OK, I'll, I'll, I'll leave any sort of political comments uh, to uh, Councillor Sanks to, to pick up in relation to sort of uh, lobbying, et cetera, of, uh, of government regarding the amounts and sums that we've got. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give a couple of points to uh, some of the factual stuff that I can deal with, uh, if that's OK, Councillor Taylor. So um, the, the issue regarding pay, uh, yeah, your, your news is more, uh, more current than mine. I, I saw that the offer had been made yesterday. I hadn't realised it had been already rejected by the unions. So uh, um, if, if, if that means that we're still likely to be going north of 2.75%, um, then as a budget uh, as, um, assumption, we've got is, is 2.25 in our budget for pay um, increase. So um, that's um, going uh, So from from that point of view, that is going to add more pressures onto uh, our current year's budget and then future IP um, uh, pressures as well. So um, you know. Councillors, you would have heard this all before. You know, there's only so many sources that this can come from. Um, it either comes from reduction in services, um, further efficiency plans that we undertake, or raising new income. You know, there's there's no um, other. I was going to use uh, magic money tree then, um, in terms of being able to uh, uh, to be able to uh, find the money there. Um, in terms of council tax collection, yes, uh, the, uh, our precept um, uh, discussions will be open with districts and offers already been made. Um, uh, yes, that's some of the intelligence I've been picking up is that uh, um, uh, the districts are seeing um, that their April collections are looking OK. But yeah, that our worry is always going to be over the sort of the next couple of months. And uh, we, we're doing some now regular reporting with CFOs just to hopefully make sure that we get that head up as soon as we start to see collection rates start to drop up off. Um, reg regarding writing of debt, uh, debt off um, uh, for the NHS, um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm not holding my breath for that for local government. However, and it's, it's, it was something that we did benefit um, at Stevenage um, in my time there, was the, um, the opportunity to make use of a capitalisation direction. If, if I was um, looking at solutions, I think the government will start to look towards local government being uh, being awarded capitalisation directions, i.e. you can actually charge some of the pressures that we're incurring against some of our capital resources. That would be probably a um, a, uh, a fix for as far as the Treasury is concerned, um, but would have impacts on us locally. But again, that is possibly too much speculation for today's meeting. Um, and. The only other point probably I'll pick up is recovery plan. Um, Yet yeah, by now we would have already uh, commenced our budget preparations for 21-22. You know we have um, uh, 14, 15 million pounds worth of savings to find for next year, let alone the 13 million to find this year. And we've um, um, 
with the time that is now needed for us to deliver quite complex transformation programs. And a good example of that is the uh, um, is, is the discussions that we're looking at having uh, with a range of uh, different um, um, uh, contractors about whether uh, we need to uh, renegotiate um, at the length of those contracts in order to give us more time for the uh, to uh, to complete their their renewal. So yeah, so that that is still ongoing. I'll probably best hand over to Councillor Sangster, uh, Chair. Okay, thanks. We're going to take a the comment from Bob first, and then Ralph will come in then, please. Thank you, Terry. Um, um, this time, I'm not going to apologise for making a repetitious comment because I think this is really important. Um, and um, as, as I look at this, it, it seems to me that it is just essential that we make it very plain to central government that we must have more money. Um, we've done a fantastic job of stepping up to the plate. Um, everybody's all hands to the pumps. We've done the right thing. Um, but when you look at the numbers that Scott and his team have um, put together, um, it's not just uh, that we're immediately short of uh, cash. What is it, 26 million as against 35? But we've got the uh, severe worry about uh, revenue, uh, particularly council tax. Um, and then the big, and there's a further big question as to how we are going to stay on track for the savings that we need to make. So if we don't get uh, funding from central government, th th this won't just be an issue for this financial year. This, is, this will be an issue that will run off over the next handful of years. Uh, and it will substantially compromise the way we can run Harbinger County Council. So, so I don't think this is an issue that we should be squeamish about. I think we should do everything we possibly can. And we should pull all our levers to make it very plain to central government that they must give us more money. Um, and uh, one of the things I'd specifically include there um, is our county MPs. I think we should um, make it very clear to our county MPs that this is a very serious issue. Uh, and I know that the county um, is right to our MPs. I think we got a message out yesterday to them um, uh, telling them what the state of play is. But I think we just have to keep delivering the message. Um, this isn't just an issue for today, for the next two months, for the period of lockdown. This is an issue that will run on if we're not careful for the next three, four, five years, I think. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, Ralph, please, any comments? I, I, clearly, I would like to echo Bob's uh, comments there. But I think what we need to do is some practical uh, uh, inter interventions here. Um, uh, as, uh, as the chair of the Resources and, and Performance Panel, when we had similar issues over other, other situations, uh, we wrote as a panel, as a, as a, a combined panel, cross-party panel, to our MPs, explaining to them why certain circumstances were uh, uh, re required their attention. And I think uh, even though we're a special panel, there should be no reason why we as a collective unit, uh, cross party, shouldn't write to every, every uh, MP in, in Hertfordshire and explain the current situation and explain to them why they should be supporting us in our endeavor to receive additional funding to support the services that our local residents need. So um, I, I think I would hope that uh, the members uh, in the special panel, uh, at least on this occasion, would support uh, Terry writing to all of our MPs and explaining that to them. Um, in addition, I think we need to coordinate our position with the CCN and the LGA uh, and the Society of, uh, of, uh, of County Treasurers and make sure they are all doing the utmost that they can to bring this to the to the to the attention of, of ministers uh, and uh, ensure that we we as a group are getting the benefit of uh, of our lobbying capacity. It seems to me that that, that there are others who are um, embarrassing the government at the moment. Embarrassing the government at the moment and getting away with it and getting money for, for uh, as a result of it. So uh, I, I know we ha as a as a as a as a as a, uh, a unit are not necessarily keen on on kicking the government when uh, when it's uh, uh, not necessary. But I think in this instance, 
it's it's merited. We need to make our views known to government, and they need to listen. So I hope we can uh, we can get together and and do it as a unit. So, Ralph, can I just clarify? When you say as a unit, are you referring to your resources panel? Fraser, I think the first the first issue I think is that is that. As a unit, as a as a panel, we should write to all our MPs, as and yes. and and as a as a cross-party panel responsible for the uh, continuation of the services that this uh, this council provides. We should explain to them why we need that extra money. But then, uh, using the other um, uh, uh, avenues, the CCN, the LGA, etc., follow up on that and continue to lobby government for um, uh, for the the, the um, the improvement in their recognition of, uh, of our need. Okay, fine, thank you. So, um, right, yeah, okay, we'll continue what we're doing, basically. Um, okay, um, I've got um, Tim, Richard, then Stephen. So, Tim? Being said. Um, but I mean, financially, the, the, the impact of, of, of COVID-19 is, is just going to be colossal. I think we all agree on that. Um, and at the end of the day, it'll be our taxpayers. And I guess as this is going to go on for a long time, it'll be a lot of the younger generation at the moment. Uh, and I wouldn't want to think that we were simply holding out a begging bowl without also providing some solutions. I think it's very important to understand that we have a responsibility. And while we're going on in asking for more and more money, at the same time, I think we've got to understand that we are part of the solution as well as the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, Richard? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, are we okay, guys? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, uh, two, two points, really. I thought I'd just say a little bit about the 23 million that we got uh, through to adult social care, which in reality, uh, government saying, uh, please throw the kitchen sink at solving uh, your, uh, your making sure that your care market doesn't collapse. Uh, and we, we did that with gusto. Um, so whether it's the Hop to Care Providers Association rece uh, receiving money to enable them to do extra recruitment and training, uh, which they have done, and we've got new recruits going into there. Um, the uh, care providers themselves will have additional costs, some of which we've asked them to carry. Um, and of course, we've, um, we're helping care providers by uh, buying beds ready should they be needed. Um, and, and I don't think we know the entirety of that cost yet. Uh, there's a little bit, bit, a little bit more going into mental health. Uh, there's the hotels uh, which have helped with those, the help, uh, those homeless or on the verge of homelessness. And there's also the Sustain and the Shield program. We know from the paper that Shield alone uh, is costing about an extra million, Sustain about an extra half million. Uh, we don't quite know uh, how long that will all go on for. So that's that's what's happening right now. I think as far as finance is concerned for the future, it's almost like it's, it's almost trying to look ahead of COVID, which in itself is quite difficult because it's a, going to be a chronic virus. It isn't going to go away, uh, not in its entirety. So we're not entirely certain how we are going to live with this virus. But if we look forward, one of the things that comes out of uh, dealing with COVID is that the cooperation across our organisations, the strength in partnership, the links back to community need to be as efficient and strong as they possibly can be. And how the county council, how local government across districts with health, with the voluntary sector, with the private sector operates, I think is going to come to the fore, absolutely to the fore. And it's probably the only way we're going to crawl out of what is going to be a very, very dark financial hole. And we're not even sure how, how deep that hole is. So I think I think that there's, what we're doing now is, is, is imperative. How we think about the future is going to be equally important, and I think we start doing that probably by our next meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. As you say, that, that's sort of the next phase, isn't it? Um, Stephen.
Is it me? Is it me next, Teresa? You gone yes, silent. I, yes, I did call you. No, Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm still on. <laughs> yeah, you are. I just unmuted at the same time you said. Uh, firstly, a question. Uh, page nine, the report, paragraph 7.4, refers to the 12 million costs for care home purchasing beds and reimbur reimbursement by the health partners. I asked a question of officers yesterday uh, where we got to on that, and I understand negotiations are still carrying on. And this links to Appendix A, where the total cost of Appendix A referred to 46.6 million, where, of course, the report itself refers to 36 million, and Ralph might want to explain this, or, or, or Scott. Uh, and also within Appendix A, you've got the, the income loss there. Uh, Pat, could we have a little bit more information on where that income loss and whether or not any of that is recoverable, depend upon when we come out of what is crucial lockdown at the moment? I suspect it will be a staggered uh, release of the lockdown. And I suppose our officers look in in terms of what we have learned so far in terms of new ways of working, i.e. this, in terms of whether or not there are potential future cost savings as a result of that. Now, clearly, a lot of the county's functions uh, require staff on the ground quite clearly, but there might be some of potential learning curves from this. I echo very much what uh, Richard has said there in terms of, of the future, but in terms of a united front, I know that David Williams has... Uh, weekly um, video conferences with the, uh, the district council leaders. And I wonder if we're writing to uh, the, uh, the minister, me, me, the chancellor, as well as uh, anyone, uh, DCLG, where it actually should be not only a united county front, but actually also from the 10 districts saying, this is the pressure from the county. You add in the pressure from the districts. This is the heart for sheer cost. Uh, of coping with COVID-19. And I think that gives a much more united front, both to the, to the MPs, who obviously want to know what's happening at their district level, as well as the county. Uh, I, given the information, that you're, the, the clear lot of exchange of information and data, I would hope that would be possible to actually have that, that position. OK, um, so could I thank you? Could I ask Scott to respond to the financial points and then perhaps Owen, do you want to respond to moving forward, please? OK, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I just uh, just in relation to the uh, the appendix A, um, the, yeah, the way that we've structured that is is your, the, the the 35 million that is sort of our stated public figure at the moment in terms of pressures is shown as the subtotal for HCC only, but then we bring in the NHS and pool budgets of 12 million, um, which will then takes us up to um, the 47 million. Um, at some of that, uh, following on from your uh, question that you kindly provided us at the uh, briefing yesterday, um, uh, Councillor Medhurst, that we, um, we we started to get a little concerned about the commitments behind from the NHS in terms of being able to meet some of these costs, um, and therefore the costs may well fall on the County Council. That is still a very live issue at the moment and is being negotiated, but uh, it is certainly a, an item or of pressure that we need to flag um, at this point until those negotiations are complete. Um, in terms of our ability to, yeah, the, so the figure at the moment is primarily that a lot of these costs are um, only for the three month phase. Some of them um, are a little bit longer, but some are just a sort of covering off for the three month period. So uh, our pressures are likely to go significantly higher. Um, if this runs on for many more months without more funding becoming available. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Owen, please. Uh, yes, uh, so the underneath the uh, strategic coordinating group uh, that is managing the overall response, uh, there is a recovery coordinating group that has been established. Um, the, that group is being coordinated by all of the district uh, council chief executives and myself. And within that work, there are dedicated elements working on community reassurance and communications with um, lots of councillors at districts and county level involved in that. There is the economic resilience cell uh, where 
Uh, Scott is chairing that, working with district councils, with Hertfordshire LEP, with the Hertfordshire Chamber of uh, Commerce, uh, and, and, and the business community generally to uh, look at how we can um, address the economic uh, implications of all of this. Uh, so uh, that work is already well underway in terms of being planned and set up because uh, it's important to be working on recovery at the same time as we're working on immediate response. Uh, that will develop uh, quite quickly and so we'll say more about that in future meetings I'm sure. Uh, one further point on the, uh, the ways of working and so on. There are undoubtedly lots of things that we'll be looking to bank uh, in terms of um, unnecessary, what, what now are clear were unnecessary travel for short meetings within the county um, and um, flexibility of where and how work can be done in all sorts of ways, both clerical, administrative and frontline. But equally, we'll be looking to learn lessons about um, some things that have been more challenging about this way of working, that people have been doing it, but it's not necessarily sustainable to do it uh, permanently or exclusively, um, particularly for those um, who don't have dedicated work settings uh, at home and having to juggle family and childcare and other caring responsibilities. So yeah, lots of positives uh, to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to learn from. Uh, and I, I think the next meeting or the meeting after that will be the one to get into more detail. Okay. Fine, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so is there anybody else that wants to make any comments or ask any questions, please? Just, just, no? one just one technical question, if I may, Teresa. There's a lot of information yeah. just come through in the public chat. I, I don't yeah. know how, how to save that and copy it so I can see it in an email. <laughs> uh, no. So, uh, so just on that, I have, officers, I have asked officers to um, save or type out, I don't know how you do it, everything in chat, because there's lots of questions there. There was additional information, which was really interesting. And quite frankly, I haven't been able to read it because I've been concentrating on the meeting as well. So I'm sure that's, um, that's something that we can do. They're basically asking officers not to clear away the chat um, too soon. Um, Steve Jarvis, you have a question. Uh, in, in terms of the forecast costs in Appendix A, I mean, it's quite clear that it's set out the, the assumptions are a period of 12 weeks. Um, but as Richard raised, the world isn't going to revert to the position it was at the end of 12 weeks. Um, there are clearly going to be significant ongoing changes. And I appreciate that it's very difficult to understand what they are at the moment. Um, but we do need to understand the process by which we're going to try and quantify those, because it seems to me that there are, um, it will become increasingly difficult to go back to the government and ask for additional additional money. Um, so what's the process by which we're trying to go, going to try and get a longer term view about what, what the range of costs might be uh, across the rest of the year? Okay, thanks for that. Um, who wants to take that one, Scott or Owen? I thought Scott. So. <laughs> Scott, please, could you respond? Apologies, Councillor John. Could you just give me the essence of that question again? I'll be, it was cutting out for me. Just, just briefly. Sorry. Uh, getting a view about what we think the range of costs post lockdown might be for the rest of the year appreciating that we don't know what's going to happen, but but uh, also that the world is not just going to revert to the way it was in before the before COVID. Yeah, um, without trying to sidestep it at the moment, um, we, we are undertaking our, our regular um, uh, monthly budget monitoring. Um, obviously, we're, we're, uh, we're not even through month one as yet. Um, and I think I'll have a better 
picture in terms of whether we're starting to see some sort of offset going on where the council's activity that would normally drive expenditure um, is now sort of um, reduced and therefore um, some of the pressures that we're experiencing get netted off um, as a result. Um, at the moment, I, I can't give you any feel for that. Um, I need a, you know, a month, at least a month or two's data to be able to provide some forecasts um, and some extrapolations for you. But my, if, if I was asked to provide a sort of a gut feel, there will definitely be some spend areas that we won't be progressing uh, because the effort is being diverted elsewhere. So uh, there will be some netting off, but I will guarantee you there will be overall net pressure on our budget beyond our current forecasts. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Um, Paul, you have a question. Uh, I think a, a few days ago about the potential impact on the ball of the financial markets on reserves and the treasury management functions. Uh, but it occurs to me, and it, it isn't in the in the paper, um, that when I got the response from that, it was that <clears throat> we've got relatively little exposure. It's mainly the pension fund that has exposure to the wider financial markets. Has there been any discussion uh, with the pension fund about the change in risk uh, to them, because, of course, the county council is liable to pay pensions if the pension fund is unable to uh, meet those those amounts. And I just wondered if, um, Scott, you had a, 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 a comment about uh, whether any discussions had, be, had been undertaken about that to try and quantify what risk in the future the county council might be exposed to were the markets to stay at kind of level they are or even fall further? Scott? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we, um, as you'd expect, uh, conversations have been uh, been taking place both with our Treasury advisors and also um, our pension administrators and, and pension investors. Um, uh, the pension advice is, is very clear, you know, that we've been through recessions, we've been through um, you know, significant downturns in our pension forecasts and uh, investment strategies take all of that into account you know without a doubt you know uh, the the impact on equities uh, what 30 40 percent or whatever reduction um in the value of equities in, in some markets will have an impact on the fund uh, short term but if you uh, you recall that based on our latest valuation we were just shy of 100 percent funded as a fund without a doubt that will now reduce um, but we equally we offset that risk against other investment instruments whether that be bonds gilts um, uh, property investments etc so we would hedge against um, not being completely exposed to the, the equity market um, but obviously the long-term run of impacts of this are difficult uh, to predict as far as our own treasury function um, that we continually monitor our, our cash flow on a daily basis um, um, obviously factoring the, the conversations that we were talking about earlier in relation to preset payments, but also our ability to be able to meet our own obligations. And I'm, I'm happy to confirm as, uh, as your uh, 151 officer that we have more than sufficient uh, cash balances to, to meet all our obligations for the foreseeable future. Sorry, did no one catch that? Apologies. Yeah, oh, I think, okay. I think okay. Terry's lost her sound, Scott, so Ralph might need to take over again. Oh, for okay. a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. I heard the whole thing, Scott, so yeah. it's fine. Um, I, think, okay. I, think, uh, I think Ralph has left the, left the meeting. I think he's lost his connection. It's over to you no, then, Ralph, Bob. Ralph's there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Ralph's still here. I can see him. He's lost his voice, though. Does somebody need to say something? So, we, we can't hear you, Ralph. I think it is your turn to speak, Ralph. We, we can't hear you.
Can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me now. Now I've got no yeah. idea what the question was because, because I got I got tossed out I got tossed out of the meeting with a with a break in the in the service. So Bob, if you want to take a question and answer it, by all means do so. Well, what, what I was thank you very much, Al. Thank you. Uh, what I was what I was going to do because I thought we'd lost you. I was just going to ask if the whole meeting is agreed with the suggestion that you've made that the panel comes together and as a common body uh, through Terry, we write to all our MPs. We've had some agreements coming in on the chat line, but I don't think everybody's confirmed their agreement. Okay, so, so, so I think we're, we're all agreed on what you've uh, suggested, Ralph. I think we've, at this minute, don't have Terry with us. Um, so I'm not sure if Terry's uh, thought that the consensus of the meeting is that through her we want to write to all MPs. Are you there, Terry? Uh, Bob, can you hear me? Uh, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, Paul, I can hear you. I'm just, I can see Terry on you. I'm just, I can see Terry on you. I am back. Can you I, hear I me? I did want to just... Yeah. <clears throat> I, I can hear you. Um, I assume everyone else can. Um, I, I just wanted to make the suggestion that, as well as our MPs, we also write to uh, either the Prime Minister or the relevant department, uh, departmental minister as well. Uh, so maybe MHCLG. Um, because I, I think just our MPs is not spreading that net wide enough. Um, so this is in relation to the letter from the resources panel. So that's going to be for you to decide, Ralph. From this panel. Maybe the panel This panel writes uh, through, through you as the chairman. Okay, fine. Sorry, I, I, I'd obviously lost that one. I lost that when I had to drop out. Okay. Um, can I have views on that? You can write them in the chat box if you'd rather. That's easier. I can't see that's a problem coming from this panel. I think when we lost you, Terry, we'd all agreed on this uh, suggestion from Ralph. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> it's quite difficult, isn't it? Um, yeah, all right, then. Can I just, Terry, can I, Terry, can I just ask, Terry, given what Paul has just said, um, do we want to expand the, uh, the um, mailing list of this uh, letter? Do we want to write to people other than our MPs? The Chancellor is an interesting example because I think I'm right to say that his immediately previous job was in charge of local government. So he might be interested to receive the letter. Yes. So I, I think it would be a good idea to write to the Chancellor. He does understand local government. Um, so I, I think that would be really useful personally. Um, and a cross party letter. I can't see any problem with that at all. Um, so I think Rishi's a better, I think probably it would more have more resonance if it went to Rishi rather than the Prime Minister. Um, but, you know, it, it's for us all to decide, but I think that's more appropriate. So we could write to Robert Gen Jenrick and also um, Rishi. Uh, Ralph. I think you've got the order right. I think we should be right to our MP, copying Rishi and copying in um, uh, Generic to uh, make sure they've got the, um, uh, the message as well. Uh, but it should come from the chair and should cover both county and district positions. Uh, and I, I'm sure Scott or, or, or Steve can prepare the letter uh, appropriately for you to sign. And we can get the, the group leaders yeah. to, to agree the wording as well. 
Okay, so that will be an additional recommendation from this. Um, it won't be to cabinet. So, um, ah, now we need a bit of process here. Um, Action point for the recommendation. We're yes, not recommending the passage. We're not recommending the cabinet do it. We're, 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 we're taking action ourselves and we're doing it. That's right. But I just need to check something. So, Quentin, can you advise whether how we um, put this into recommendations? Because these panels, recommendations to cabinet. So I just want to clarify the governance. The governance. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you hear me OK? Yeah, it's in, in, in the circumstances, it may be the most sensible thing to do is for the chief executive, the letter to come from the chief executive, and but, but reflect that it is from the cross-party panel. I would have thought that that might have been the best, uh, the, most, the most straightforward approach, um, particularly when it's a cross-party um, group. Okay, I'm not sure that everybody would be happy with that. Yeah. So, um, so shall we um, put a recommendation in or resolve rather than a recommendation and then we follow that offline as to the route we take. But I just thought it would be appropriate for everybody on the panel to be included rather than from the chief executive because this is more of an executive role than um, an officer role um would panel be happy with that route that we make a, we resolve and then follow it through after the meeting yeah i'm seeing thumbs and yes and great okay so we will we will we will make a resolution there then Right, so are there any other questions on the financial papers? No? Everything's okay. So we can then, um, so I'll just move to the recommendations then. So at the moment, we have a res res resolution um, that this panel. Um, so that the chairman of this panel write to the chancellor, um, the secretary of state for um, MHCLG and MPs on behalf of all the members of the panel, joint panel, to um, draw to their attention uh, the current financial position and the forward um, financial position of the county and districts in Hertfordshire or something like that sort of thing. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing I'm seeing thumbs, so thank you very much. That's that's useful. Okay. So officers, I hope you've got that down right vaguely. Um and then there's the recommendations um that are in your papers, which are on uh, page thirty four of your agenda pack. Can we take those uh, together? And please, may I ask for um, approval of the recommendations? Can you just show your thumbs? That would be great. Yeah, are we all in agreement with the recommendations? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Moving on to item four on the agenda, there are no public petitions. Um, I have not been given any other business. Um, and there's, there's no, the next meeting date will be confirmed in due course. Can I thank you all very much for working with me and the technology? Um, normally my uh, hopes with all this, but obviously not today. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for taking part members. I'm very grateful for officers' input. It's been really good, and I think we've all used chat quite a lot and enjoyed it, Judy. Um, so um, thank you very much, and uh, can I wish you um, a safe and happy weekend? Thank you very much. Bye.